Hello everyone, you're watching the Smoking Hot Coffee Show. My name is Omul Patel, I'm in Los Angeles, I'm joined with... Jeff Pelton down here in San Diego. And so today we have a really great interview with Rob Walling from the NUMA Group. Uh, he has been doing software as a startup and making money off of uh, web-based software for almost 14 years now. And he, he's, he's got a lot of history and he knows a lot about this space. Uh, Jeff, what, what were some of the key takeaways you got out of this awesome interview? Wow. Well, he surely didn't do all this overnight. It took him 14 no. years, I think he says. Yeah. Uh, so he really uh, learned a lot through all of these projects that he went through. I'll just scroll through the list real quick, and you can see on the left yeah. the software products, and on the right some of the information products like yeah. books and things. Yeah, so we've got Drip, we've got Stay Smart, Stay Small, Stay Smart, Starts for the Rest of Us, Hit Tail, which is another app. He's got his blog, which he's been blogging for several years. He's got .NET Invoice, mm -hmm. Wedding Toolbox, another uh, type of app, uh, Microconference, which is a conference for self-funded uh, startup founders, uh, Micropreneur Academy, Apprentice Line Jobs. Yeah, uh, Jeff, he's got quite a portfolio. How does he maintain yep. all this stuff, Jeff? What's your... That, that was my big question, right? I think he's come from the trenches like we all want to, mm -hmm. uh, our audience at least. Yep. And he really tells us how he was able to stay focused, uh, use his team to... Uh, really keep his focus on the project at hand uh, and kind of grow, you know, find the best practices, you know, find the pr profitable products, cut, yeah. cut out the failures. And he, there were certainly failures, although we didn't talk uh, extensively about them. Uh, you know, we have to reiterate over 14 years, uh, it took him, you know, a while to put together all that he learned. Yeah, and, and um, you know, one of the key goals of any startup founder, especially a single person working around his basement or bedroom or whatever you, uh, is to get to that eight to $10,000 monthly revenue where you're, if you're making that and it's built, you know, it's a product that you don't need to be exchanging your time for money. Uh, that was one of the key takeaways that I got out of this is how quickly you you know what you need to do to get to that you know uh, in his case he ended up buying some uh, struggling software that wasn't really making a lot of money he mm -hmm. bought them rehabbed them and improved them and, and and you know started making money that way and he she was you know, nice enough to share his insights there Jeff yeah it was a great story uh, for us all to you know try to do this ourselves it's not easy uh, it's difficult you have to learn from your mistakes and your successes uh, we also spent a little bit of time talking about podcasting and our, uh, yeah. you know, how much we love content marketing and blogging and how the two relate. Mm -hmm. uh, so we really had a, a lot in common uh, yeah. with Rob. It was great to talk to him. And, and Rob also talked uh, about the nuts and bolts, about trying to get a landing page up quickly, testing different mm -hmm. headlines, trying to drive a little bit yeah. of traffic to it, figuring out what's working. He used the same mechanism, uh, same methodology for his micro conference. How his, his initial, his first, he threw up the landing page. How many signups based on the number of signups? He then decided to take the next step. It takes a lot of money and effort to put these things on. You want to see, you want to make, you want to make yourself feel comfortable. Okay, yeah, we'll hit the minimum number of signups. All right, this is going to be a go. Let's run with this. And he talks a little yep. about that. Proving it ahead of time is a really great strategy. Yeah, yeah. And so there's a ton. I, I kid you not, guys. There's a ton of amazing stuff in this interview. Uh, we ran, re, ran yeah, pretty couldn't, long. Couldn't believe how long we talked. <laughs> yeah. And we ran a good hour and a half almost on this. Mm -hmm. And uh, and let me tell you, uh, for those that are uh, those that are willing to listen to the rest of it, there's just amazing, amazing nuggets in here. If you are considering running a startup, if you're considering doing something on the side while you still have your job and you're, you know, you're trying to bootstrap it so that you don't need to take any more money from anybody and and, you, and you've got a product that's uh, you know create that lifestyle business so to speak this is gonna be an amazing interview I definitely think you should hang on to that yeah you gotta listen to this one all the way through yeah. and for all of our audience out there please do go to iTunes and leave us a review and you know send us an email info at smokinghotcoffee.com yeah. if you guys like the show uh, if you have ideas about stuff that we talk about through this episode, we talk a lot about content marketing, podcasting, blogging, right. the format of this show itself. Yeah. So if you guys, anything bad or other topics that we discuss, if anything rings a bell, just please shoot us a line. We are listening. Uh, you can also reach us on Twitter and everything through our website yeah. at smokinghotcoffee.com. And our email, once again, is info at smokinghotcoffee. Uh, I want to reiterate that, uh, you know, Jeff uh, basically is saying that if you uh, care even the slightest that we're doing this. I'm telling you, uh, that one person out of 50 that emails this just mm -hmm. makes our whole year, man. It, 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 getting these great emails, even if it's critical, really lets us know that, yeah, there are people actually listening to this stuff. It isn't just me and Jeff farting around in our bedrooms yeah. doing this. Yeah, I mean, just to go on, before we get into the episode today, it is really hard for us to 
aggregate um, all the traffic on the site. So this is an experiment for us. We're a startup. Uh, our strategy so far has been to post these videos to YouTube. Yeah. We're doing a video format. That's kind of crazy. Most people are either just listening to this in the background or you're subscribing to our audio version uh, through iTunes or Stitcher. And so we're still not sure which is working the best or which ones we should cut out and uh, know which ones to focus on. Right. So if you're listening out there, please let us know how you're listening and what yeah. parts you like, what parts you don't, so yeah. we can keep uh, getting, you know, be lean and cut out the fat and uh, continue to improve. Yeah, and if there is uh, any of the folks that are listening that would love to uh, be on or possibly even sponsor the show, uh, we're looking for actively looking for sponsors, so if you're looking to try to help support us, uh, please reach out to us, info at Smoking Hot Coffee. And with that, Jeff, uh, let's well, get to the interview. Let me let me also say we're looking for partners of all kinds. If you want to, you know, if you know a startup that we should have on the show or any other conversations that you guys want to strike up with us, please do reach out. You know, uh, I'm a big fan of all the stuff you've been doing and uh, the micro. Uh, what what is it called micro surf? Micro. Sorry. Micro. Microconf is a conference and mi that's it. micropreneur. Yeah. Yeah, micropreneur. That's it. And I and I remember looking at the landing page thinking, oh my god, this is so awesome. And then I looked at the pricing. I'm like, oh, my God, I wish I had more money. Yes. <laughs> uh, are you recording these? Are you going to ever let uh, people that don't go to the conference access to that, that stuff for, for a premium? Or... Yeah. Oh, we lost your um, audio. Oh, there we go. Okay. There you go. Really? Am I back? All right. Yeah, you're back. Um, if you go to microconf.com right now, you can see all the talks from last year. Oh really? Oh, okay. 2012. Yep. Oh, it's only fantastic. linked. It's lower left of the homepage. You can you can get there from there. Okay. Um. Right, see right under that YouTube video, or it might be on the right on your screen, but there should be a video that or a link that says "Watch all the talks." Oh, watch all the talks. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So we did we did video uh, 2013, but we're not going to have those for a while. That's awesome. Yeah. This is They're such an happen. amazing resource, man. Yeah, this is huge. This is huge. This is huge. Yeah, it's, Anybody it's that's popular. watching our show, please turn our show off and go <laughs> to this and start watching this stuff. I mean, look at this. You guys got some big names. How, how are you able to yes. get these guys on? What, what's your secret sauce here? Well, it's our third year now, and these things, they really build. And so the first year was the, was the tough part. But okay. once we got uh, momentum, yeah. now it's it's easier and easier. Um, right. uh, to be honest, the, the, the way, you know, like getting Jason Cohen or Heaton Shaw, it was yeah. about, it, like without my blog, the initial popularity of just writing for five years and, and having some people following me, yeah. I, I don't think we would have been able to put it on. Oh, um, really? That so you... was kind of the, yeah, and the podcast. We have a podcast as well, that right. kind of stuff. Right. Okay. You've been blogging for five years. I know, five so, years. Uh, overnight success, right? Yeah. So I've actually been blogging for eight years, since 2005, okay. but it was yeah. about five when we started the first microconf. So, yeah. Wow. wow. I have to say, Rob, uh, you know, I, I tried blogging so many times, man. I tried like doing it. I really believe in content marketing and all that stuff. I really believe in all this stuff, but I just, you know, God, I don't know what my hangup is. I, I'll get into a groove and then it's like going to the gym. I'll just kind of fall off. And then how do you, how do you, are you writing consistently? What, what are your tips for people that need to start writing? What would you say, share? So that's the thing. I'm actually not writing consistently anymore. And what happened is I discovered that I kind of got over the whole needing to write everything down. And I really enjoy the podcasting and the conferences. I enjoy okay. speaking. Yeah. So if I were to go and if I were to do another effort, it would be like another podcast or something. Okay. And so that gotcha. you may need to look at yourself and say, Hey, I yeah. just, I'm not going to do it. It doesn't work for everybody. <laughs> right, right. You know? Yeah. So I mean, but for the, you know, I blogged pretty consistently for about six or seven years. And that the reason I did that was from, um, it was like having laser focus motivation. I had one goal, and that was to to get out of consulting. And then the goal was to help other people do the same. And so that yeah, was awesome. the, you know, as long as you have that, like I think that that motivates you to do it. That's Can awesome. You tell us, when did you uh, start moving into podcasting? Like what spawned that, and how long yep. ago was it? It was boy. It was. I'd say it's about three years. Although that might be a ways off. I'll, as I'm talking, I'll click look back at the date. Okay. Um, but Oh, it was March of 2010. Okay. So it was about three years, yeah. Okay. Um, it became, you know, I'd been blogging for uh, five years by then, and I had also followed a bunch of bloggers. And the the thing that blew my mind was when the Stack Exchange podcast happened, and Joel Spolsky and Jeff Atwood, people who I had followed for years right, and right. had read everything they wrote, yeah. I started listening to their podcast, and I was mm -hmm. instantly... 10 times more interested okay. in what they were doing day to day. And I realized 
this is this g- g- changes everything. Yeah, this right, whole yeah. medium yeah. is completely different because I read every word that Joel Spolsky had written on right, his blog, right, right. and yeah. yet hearing him talk for one hour, yeah. I was like, yeah. I, I want to be with this guy. You know what I'm saying? It like right, right. It, it's a completely different yeah. level of of um, no, a, a different connection, right? You kind of feel the guy. Whole, yeah, it's a, yeah. It's a, um, uh, a whole new depth. Yeah, That's right. a whole new depth. That's yeah. Right, and so I realized. I've been blogging and I almost feel like I kind of look back and I was like, man, have I wasted my time? You know, and <laughs> the, the end result answer is no, I hadn't wasted my time. But within the first 10, 15 episodes, we we had a tiny, we had 10% of the audience that my entire blog did. Yeah. But already we had more engagement. Already we had mm-hmm. people writing it. Already, you know, I mean, it took me years to get to that point with the blog. Right. So the medium, I've fallen in love with this, with the audio and mm-hmm. we do only do audio, but video is the same. Um, I just, I think it's just, the, I really do believe it's the future. And I've actually stopped reading most blogs at this point. If, wow. if it doesn't wind up getting read, read into a podcast form, which okay, some people are cool. doing, yeah. I, I tend to miss it. You know? That is mm-hmm. so awesome. So Jeff and I have been Beautiful. debating. One of the big, big things that we've been looking is the analytics on our YouTube uh, clips. And, you know, we notice fall offs after about five or ten minutes, another deep fall off after 20 minutes. And so we've thought about bringing on some editors. In fact, we have a video editor working on a couple of clips right now, taking our one hour, condensing them down to maybe 15, 20 minutes of the best of of that hour. And, and uh, you know, and Jeff and I are also going to start writing these big epic posts so that, you know, big, long, huge posts describing all the little things that we've learned in each episode. And I have to say, Rob, um, I part of me doesn't want to edit the big uh, podcast down to 15 minutes. I kind of like the the raw nature of it, just playing it in the background while I'm designing or whatever it is that I'm doing. What's your what's right. your feeling on all this? I think that so in in talking to uh, Andrew Warner from Mixergy, yeah. he spoke mm-hmm. at the first microconf and then in in hearing other big video podcasters like Leo Laporte with the Twin mm-hmm. Network yeah. and yeah. other guys um, they say that like 90% of their audience is audio and the other 10 5 or 10% is video okay. so if okay. you guys i don't know if you put out uh, an all audio feed through iTunes yeah we you do. do. Okay, yeah, do. good. Yeah. It's a no-brainer. I, I need to go mm-hmm. subscribe. That's funny. I because I hadn't I hadn't heard you guys before now. But um, okay. that is for me. It's all about audio. I actually don't mm-hmm. watch video. If any video, if a video is longer than five minutes online, right. I'm, pro- I'm very much uh, not very likely to watch it. Gotcha. Um, mm-hmm. The exception are conference talks because you kind of need the visuals. So okay. like when Business Software puts out their stuff, okay. or if I want to watch the microcom stuff, I do have a, I have three monitors and I'll put it on the side monitor. Gotcha. But right. you know. Long form video on the web is no one's really cracked that, you know. Yeah. That's why people yeah. really yeah. are putting their stuff out in audio. So. Right, right. So one thought I yeah. had, uh, Jeff. I'm sorry, go ahead. You were gonna say. Uh, yeah. So I mean, YouTube's nice because it's easy. We can just throw it up there, and then people can minimize it. They don't have to watch it, and they can just listen to it. But it seems fairly accessible. What are your other thoughts on you know bridging the gap from blogging? You know, it's great to hear that you kind of came from the blogging and went to podcasting. You know, Amul and I were struggling blogging. We wanted to, but it's hard. We feel the pressure. We were like, oh, we got to perfect it. And we're, with the video podcast to coming together, it's been easier for us to just spit stuff out and upload it. Uh, we keep each other accountable. Um, but what? Do, how do you look at podcasting um, and the the text form of it? Do you, the description field? How much do you transcribe? How much do you editorialize? We've been struggling trying to figure out how much uh, should we write a blog post around the podcast episode. That sort of thinking. What's sure. your strategy there? Yeah, really good question. So I've given this a lot of thought and a lot of research. Right. Um, so I have a lot of, of thoughts on it. Love First it. thing is, if you want to, the, the iTunes search engine is is fairly easy to influence I'll say it's kind of like it's like like Google in 2002 right okay. they they didn't they weren't that sophisticated mm-hmm. okay. um, there are actually a lot of search engines like that right now the iTunes is one wordpress.org with the plugin and theme search engine is another I know a lot of people oh, who are great. using it. that to their advantage okay but love it. Uh, but come so come back to iTunes if you I mean they do use things like reviews and and likes and such not likes what is it it's ratings the five star mm-hmm. ratings and yeah. then it's comments and the more of those you yeah. get the yeah. better yeah. Um, but in order for them to even know how you appear it really is like the old meta tag you put you, you got to make sure you get your solid keywords in so if mm-hmm. your audience is startups then you know get it get in there for startup or startups right. uh, you'll be competing against us because that's what we're going after too <laughs> but um so that's cool. the show level ranking right when someone okay. searches okay in terms of trying to rank your your blog essentially you know you, you have this WordPress install I assume that that then spits out your your feed mm-hmm. um, and in terms of each individual post what we found we get every every individual episode transcribed. So we have these okay. huge pages. And originally the goal was for SEO. 
right? Hey, yep. organic stuff. Right. That has completely failed. We are 133 really? episodes in. We get almost zero organic oh, traffic that's, based that's, on Jared. That is very so, interesting. Totally not worth your time. And wow. there's a couple reasons for that, or at least my theory. Yeah, let's number hear one is, Number one is the it, they're huge. I mean, how many? It's like 10,000 words or something on this page. Yeah, Maybe yeah. it's 5,000, but it's way too much. It's not focused mm-hmm. enough. So the the way that um, that you would want to do it if you actually wanted to rank is you would title the the pod that right. specific episode right. something, right? Right, right. That, that it's not for their search engines, but you have to keep that in mind. Right. And then you would do exactly what you what you just said, which is write a short, focused summary of it okay. that also talks about that. If you really right. want to try to rank for those keywords, gotcha. that, that's what I'd do. Right, right. so have it in the title Trans- tag, have 1,500 words, let's say, something like that with the right... Yeah. Right, that's keyword right. Uh, density and all that. Got you. One of the other big differences that uh, is in the same vein uh, between text like blogging and audio podcasting is with a, a blog post, you can scroll through, you can skim, you can you know you can quickly uh, skip through it. With audio, it's a lot harder to do. Um, you know, we're thinking about using the description field as sort of a table of contents to help people summarize and understand the agenda of the show. With time code um, bookmarks, right? Yeah, we were going to use time codes and you know actually make it like a hard coded table of contents. What do you what do you think about that? You know, with audio podcasting, do you guys do like an agenda up front or stuff yeah, like that? Yeah, so we we don't. What we do, I've seen people do the the time uh, the chapters like you're saying. Yeah, chapters. Yeah. And it always for me as a listener, it felt weird because no one else does it. And so I was a little disoriented by it. Um, mm-hmm. I also got the feeling, it might, I don't know how much time it took these guys to do it, but I was thinking, yeah. like, man, I hope this doesn't take a lot of time because <laughs> yeah. it, you know, it, you kind of got to balance that. If yeah. you really are going to put out a show a week or a show a day, a day you yeah. have to balance that. Um, we don't do any of that. What we try to do is make each episode focus around a very specific tight topic and we also ours is audio only and then we edit it down we'll talk for 45 minutes or 50 minutes and we try to edit it down to about 30 minutes to yeah. really only get the best stuff and that's it and it's kind of like gotcha. I don't yeah if if you don't want to hear the whole thing then you should turn it off you know but mm-hmm. there are enough people that do want to hear it so right right awesome. that's I don't know if the chapter stuff is fast for you I would consider it but other than that I don't I don't know. I, even, I wonder how many people would would really take advantage of it. You know? I, I've even, you know, I've posed this question, Rob, to other other guests of ours. We had a VC on earlier, and and you know, and he was just like, you know, well, you know, an hour long is fine if it's entertaining. People aren't turning off, th- you know, Throne of whatever that that show on on the HBO. Game of Thrones and- Throne, yeah, Throne of Kings, and they're watching that because it's entertaining. Mad Men, same thing. I, I got to get on and watch my Mad Men. And so I was telling Jeff, I go, maybe we can bring on a couple of editors and we can talk to some other content, uh, people that do completely different content but related to science or technology, and then every five minutes cut to different pieces and then cut back to the interview and almost create this variety show. Uh, And so I've been maybe mulling that idea around. And uh, I don't know, what, what are your thoughts on that, Rob? On on mixing it up and not just having interviews, basically yeah. adding another and content. Make, and making people sit yeah, around for an hour on YouTube watching. Just various formats, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's the thing. I think that I really do think that um I think that could work. I think it's I think the audio that audio is the present and video is the future. And so I think if you're spending a lot of time doing video stuff, you're kind of you're playing it down the line. You know, you're you're looking a few years down the line at okay. this point. Um, I just don't think there's going to be mass adoption on it. So okay. I love the idea of an interview show that intersperses content. That's kind of like a This American Life, right? Or yeah. 99% yeah, yeah, yeah. That's really yeah. what those are if you think yeah. about it. It's an interview, yeah. then yeah. they splice in music. But I love that idea. I have an idea to do a startup show like that. It would be different than what you're talking about. But okay. that sounds amazing. Um, right. uh, that sounds amazing. Yeah, I would totally tune into that. I would love that. I, for me, I would be like, "Oh, this is cool." This, you know, especially if we, if we had uh, other content partners going to incubators, physically being there. Because Jeff and I had went to Sunnyvale. We we're at this big incubator up there, and plug and play. I don't know if you've heard of them, mm-hmm. uh, but we were there. You know, actually walking around with a little mic and all that, and it'd be kind of fun to 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 cut back and forth between content you know, related to startups and startup founders and all that kind of thing. So Right. To make it more of a show of an yeah. actual almost like a TV show type almost thing like rather a than TV, just an exactly. interview. Yeah. A, um, Jeff and I our history has been actually in uh actual shows. We we worked at a startup in Beverly Hills and they actually had a set and we interviewed a bunch of celebrities and we cut to them being on the movie set and stuff. So 
uh, we, you know, that's kind of a little bit of my background and Jeff as well, a little bit as well. Yeah, so. definitely. Right. Have, have you guys thought about how how to monetize it? Because that's actually oh, the biggest yes. the biggest <laughs> thing I've seen podcasts cancel or fade or whatever yeah. is yeah. people mm -hmm. lose interest because they can't fund it. They can't yeah. justify their right. time or they can't hire out the editing or whatever. No, so. Absolutely. Yeah, that's what we're working on right now. We're kind of streamlining our production and uh, kind of seeking uh, sponsorship as we clean up the website. Yeah, our, yeah. No, we're, we're trying to get some sponsors on right now. It's 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 a tough road, Rob. And I, I, this has been a big time commitment for myself and Jeff. Uh, mm -hmm. Every day we're trying to do this Monday through Friday, every afternoon, and setting up the scheduling and the back and forth, and then, then obviously doing this and then the uploading. And it's a lot yep. of work. It is. It's a lot yep. of work. And I don't want to burn out. I love doing this. I don't know about you, Jeff, but I love this stuff. And yeah, I think this is great. Yeah, it's a ton of fun. I've learned more than uh, I think I've learned doing anything else in the past. Yeah, yeah, it's been great. I'm sure you're feeling the same way with the, your conferences. Um, I don't know, uh, Rob. I, I God, I, I'm really, I'm trying to, I'm hoping sponsorships might work. I don't know, to be honest with you, man. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so the models I've seen work because I'm, I'm. If you don't find a, a revenue model, then you just can't do it forever. Like yeah, no, no one does right. it forever, right? right. Mm -hmm. um, so the the models you could do ads do work. I know that Mixergy also does the premium content, and that's worked better for him than ads. I think he, these days he said he doesn't even pursue ads anymore. They have to approach him. Okay. And then the third way is like if you watch David Seitman Garland on uh, the top. What is it? Oh man. Rise to the top. Oh, right he to the puts top, out yeah. some some info. It's kind of some info products, like video training courses on how to do interviews and how to do that stuff. So right. those are the three ways I've seen. And actually, Mike and I, you know, with our podcast startups for the rest of us, the only reason we're 133 episodes in and we are like clockwork every week yeah. is because it is in our ecosystem and we have other revenue streams. We don't monetize the podcast directly, but it's how we put on the conference, right? Okay. And it's okay. how we we have a, a micropreneur academy. At, it's an online startup school we have. Okay. Without those other things yeah. making money mm -hmm. for us, yeah. podcasts would have died within six months because it's so. It's what, why don't you go into like how many do you do every day or week or what's what's your schedule looking like between sure. you and him? The the podcast? Yeah, podcast. Yeah. yeah, it's just it's one episode every Tuesday morning. Okay. That's it, and it's about they tend to be about thirty minutes between thirty and forty minutes, okay. and we record our effort. We hire everything out, and that's our thing. Like we are so busy yeah. doing our actual startups right, that right. that we said early on, we're not gonna edit the thing. We're yeah. not gonna mm -hmm. transcribe the thing. We're not. We don't even post it. Like we have right. our editor post it into WordPress. Beautiful. Puts the transcription and everything. Yeah. So yeah. our total time commitment is about for each episode is about ninety minutes, and that okay. includes outlining it. Okay. Includes all the content, you know. Okay. And so one of us puts together an outline. We get on. We talk for like I said about an hour, okay. and then we just put that MP3 into Dropbox, and okay. from there. It's scheduled and it right. appears next Very Tuesday cool. morning. So. Oh, that's awesome. That's great. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to get that going right now. We've been on Odesk and Fiverr and some other sources to try to find some people to help us out. And yeah. I'm trying to do the same thing. I'm, I've been, you know, I've been on this with Jeff. Like, we got to outsource all of this because yeah. we're gonna mm -hmm. burn out. We're I'm already burning out. Uh, so, yep. Uh, yep. And it's it's not cheap. Yeah. For sure, but you got to you got to figure out how to make it work. You yeah. Know? yeah. 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 Um, it's so great that you're. Go, go ahead. I'm sorry, Jeff. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to ask uh, more about podcasting and the rise of it. Like, you know, we're early adopters. We're in the tech scene. You know, I've been, you know, I followed Leo Laporte since the screensavers. And, you know, so I followed him over to Tech TV. And, you know, obviously, as techies, we're all fans of RSS and this stuff. H how do you see uh, non-early adopters using podcasting? Uh, is it apps like Stitcher that are going to make the difference? Is it the integration to the cars? Like, what, what's the oh, next thing going to be uh, for yep. podcasting in the mainstream? Yep, that is a really good question. I've also thought a lot about this. My mm -hmm. wife started a podcast, uh, oh, you know, oh, really? two months ago, and she's a psychologist. Like that, that is where it's penetrating. Wow, it's that's people, awesome. People you got your wife who, into this. I well, she I'm, she kept she kept struggling with the blogging thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, that's cool because I, I'm trying to get my wife doing the same thing. I, I want her to yep. blog about bags. She's a big bag yep. lover, and I'm like, maybe we should do podcasts. So tell me, how, how'd you get her going? Well, that was the thing. We kept going back and forth. She started three different blogs over the course of a couple years. I would always set her up with the WordPress install, and she'd go, and she'd write good things, and then she'd just say, it's too time-consuming. Right, right, right. It's mm -hmm. hours for a post. Yeah, I don't right. know what I'm doing. Right, right, I don't, right. you know, and, and eventually, we, I said, well, why don't you, you love – she loves NPR, right? She right. has some shows she loves, Terry Gross and, and Krista Tippett on, on, uh, on being – I mean, she just said – I said, you could, you could interview people. And okay. she, so she does, it's called Parenting Reimagined. It's a parenting show, but it's okay. not her giving advice. It's her interviewing, all, getting all these stories of parents. Oh, and okay. so the, the beauty of it is I already had this set up, right? I have, right. 
I, I know Audacity and all that, you know, Skype mm -hmm. recorder or whatever. Right. And she just went with it. And so to see her doing that makes me realize this is, this is the future. Like it's it's the oh, I don't it's not citizen journalism. It's like blogs mm -hmm. will be around, but we're just moving since everyone's mobile and everyone has the capability all the time to listen to this stuff. Right, this right. is, this is a big deal. And so, yeah, we, you're right. We are the early adopters. The way mm -hmm. it gets to the masses is the car integration. I totally agree with yeah, you. The I'm car integration has got to happen. Yeah. It's going to be epic. Right. And when that happens, I even think, um, just the fact that everyone has iPhones now, Stitcher and, and mm -hmm. that kind of stuff is, is definitely making a difference. The po our podcasting audience is, I think it's, is it five X eight X since we started? And I don't think, I mean, a lot of people find us through iTunes, okay. just stumbling around, and it's kind of like the longer you're out there, the more people that are just in the ecosystem. And once I found that once people start listening to podcasts, it's tough for them. It's addictive. I know yeah. I'm subscribed to 55 podcasts. Yeah, like yeah, yeah. I, that's wow. what I do. You know, yeah. that's all I do when I'm not at a computer. So. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I agree. I completely agree. There's a, a few in the business section. Uh, I think lifestyle uh, podcast. I love those guys, man. Uh, yep. They're I think Dan from San Andy. Diego. Yeah, Dan. For sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, those guys. Are I'm awesome. trying to, I'm trying to pull all of our audience from now on what podcasts they listen to and how they subscribe and such because of the early adopter sort of question I just posed. Uh, so it sounds like you're using iTunes uh, to subscribe, maybe on your iPhone as well, using the podcast app. Or I am, yeah, okay. and that's just because I've never done. I never had the need for Stitcher and the other things. I, okay. I would bet and Downcast or whatever. I bet they're better apps because the podcast app is not that good. But right. I've just always been in the ecosystem. Gotcha, cool. gotcha. All right, so Rob, let's let's segue into some of your other businesses. I'm I'm a sure. huge fan of having s lots of different startups, like small, like you've got the wedding building site, and you've got a couple of other things that you're doing. I love this, man. I mean, I'm, you don't understand. I saw this. I'm like, oh, this is so great that he's got multiple streams of revenue going, and you're bootstrapping it yourself. You're not. Uh, you know, I love all that stuff. So tell us uh, your early journey. Are you buying these things off of, off of Flippa? Are you rehabbing them? Are you doing this stuff from scratch? Uh, give us your story here a little bit. On the that. rundown, yeah. You know, if you flip the screenshot to um, okay. the the Numa Group .com, actually, I could probably paste it in. That kind of gives you an overview of, of all of my apps. Okay. Yeah. I'll paste it in the chat window. But um, I basically have two sides of, of this story. One is my software products, like you mentioned, and the other one is the stuff I do to help other startups. Okay. And so the yeah. left-hand side there is, you know, Drip. These are all web apps. Right. And then on the right-hand side is the info products. It's, it's a book I've written. It's the podcast. Mm -hmm. It's my blog, the gotcha. conference, gotcha. and online startup school. I love it. So I started, I was a, a salaried developer. I mean, I'm a coder from the age, age eight. And okay. when around 2000, I was working in the dot com boom and then the bust, and I just started working a couple years earlier. And so yeah. I was became a contractor, okay. and that was great fun for a couple of years until I realized that it is a hamster wheel. <laughs> you are just running and running and running. Right, and right. no matter how high you raise your rate, yeah. when you stop working, you make zero dollars. Yeah, and yeah. so I knew it wasn't sustainable. I yeah. knew that I wasn't going to do that when I was 55 or right. 60. And I kept looking like, what is the next thing? And realizing the products are the way out of that. Yeah, yeah. And so mm -hmm. this is, you know, 2001, I'm putting this together, reading Joel Spolsky, Paul Graham. They were the mm -hmm. only, really the only bloggers in that space at the time. Okay. And trying to get products launched. So I started building them from scratch. I probably built five different really bad product ideas. Okay. Things that, you know, there was no market testing. There was no lean startup. There wasn't. I didn't have any of my landing page approaches down. Right, right, right. I mean, it was just like a mess, you know. So yeah. I would I would spend six months in a basement. I would build something and launch it and then make $200 in revenue in a year and then quit, okay. you know, okay, and right. over and over because I just didn't know what I was doing. Yeah. And then eventually I, I did th just through sheer whatever determination and, and fire, uh, you know, being baptized by fire about five or six years into it. I knew enough about marketing that I started having some small successes. I got better. Okay. At Very cool. It. Good, good. So tell us what, what uh, are you really done focusing on the long tail, getting your landing pages together? What, what was the big early breakthroughs that big early wins? Yeah. The big early wins I learned are one of them is I don't do businesses now that don't have some type of recurring revenue. Very cool. Because, so subscription only. Have, None of this yep. one off. Yeah, okay. one off. I have mm -hmm. met many one offs, and they are just they're so hard to grow. Okay. I just won't do it again. Very cool. Um, another thing is, yeah, I get a landing page up 
before I start coding or before I do anything. Whoa. Even even if I'm not driving a bunch of traffic to it, I yeah. just want it up there to be mm -hmm. testing some messages. Before mm -hmm. we put on the first microconf, we had a landing page. We had no venue. Okay. All we had was the the a yes from two speakers okay. and and two others, my, Mike and myself, okay. and we basically said, if you're interested in coming to this conference, put your email in here. It'll be in Vegas on these days, and we uh, had no venue. And we awesome. wanted to see, could we put, because to put a conference on is tens of thousands of dollars and yeah. hundreds of hours. Yeah. Can we get enough interest? And we right. did. Before mm -hmm. I wrote my book, I put up a landing page, okay. and I said, do you want to hear a book on this subject? Because yeah. if you don't, then I'm not going to write it. You know, So mm -hmm. it's that kind of stuff. Oh, so it's brilliant. I'm really big. You start marketing before you start. Okay. All right. This. So I'm going to step uh, get, go into this a little deeper. Okay. So you, mm -hmm. how are you? So you got the landing page. You got a little bit of the copy writing up there. You maybe got a couple of images. Uh, you've got an email submit. How are you driving traffic? Are you doing? Are you SEOing like the title uh, and just trying some long tail titles and then a little bit? Of, uh, are you doing PPC? What are you doing? SEO takes too long. Okay. Because it just. It takes a long yeah, time to get enough time. traffic, yeah. right? Yeah. It, it, you, to be competitive for a keyword with enough traffic, it's yeah. really, really hard. It, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So since I'm I'm putting up landing pages within the ecosystem that it's kind of our startup ecosystem. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, I, I start with my I call it concentric circles. So my inner concentric circle is my stuff I control. That's my Twitter account, my blog, my podcast, okay. and my email list. Okay. And so I'll. Oof, you know, ping out to those guys and say, "Hey, are you interested in this?" Right, right. The next concentric circle is okay. people, is audiences of people that I know. So okay. I might come on this podcast and yeah. say, "Hey, I'm launching an, uh, an email marketing app called Drip that helps gotcha. you improve conversion rates." Right, right, right. Mm -hmm. And so go to getdrip.com. Yeah. And which uh, I'm this is actual pitch. Go to getdrip.com. Yeah, and there's a landing page. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. I yeah. might get. 10 or between 10 and 50 emails just from this appearance here. Gotcha. Okay, so that's another way. So that's the next concentric circles is kind of going to people okay. that I know okay. or appearing on podcasts. Okay. Um, the next one out is I will go, well, I'll submit it. Someone will submit it to Hacker News eventually. I don't tend to, but someone okay. will, I'll write a post about it or something and it will go up on Hacker News and, and okay. get a few hundred from there. Okay. And then I do some pay per click. I'll use either Google, LinkedIn, or Facebook. Those are the three. Okay. That work and so okay. I've done that with Drip specifically. Um, the Drip launch list is just over fourteen hundred emails. Oh, that's great! And um, yeah, it's, okay. it's so, good. So let me ask you then: when you put up a landing page like that and you're looking for validation, what is the bar for validation for Drip or for your book? How many email signups or what was yep. the, the convert? You know, what what did it take to prove to you that you wanted to write the book? Right. Good question. With the book, I wanted to make at least six thousand dollars. To pay for my time to write it. Very nice. And so I did the math. I went backwards okay. and said, "All right, it's going to be thirty dollars for the you know the PDF and the paper. Okay. I need to sell two hundred copies, which okay. isn't very much. Is right. that right? Two hundred right. times thirty? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, and so I said, "How many emails do I need to sell two hundred? And I said, ah, "I bet if I get six hundred emails, I can okay. probably." Hopefully convert a third. Okay, that's what that. I was going to ask you. Your wow. conversions. Yep. Okay, so you're thinking third, thirty percent convert. Yep. That's pretty high, but maybe it's it, such a targeted. It is high. It's number one. It's targeted. Number two, I knew a good chunk of the audience was my audience, so it would be a yeah, higher yeah. conversion rate. Number right. three, it's a one-time payment, and number four, it's less than fifty bucks. Oh, All look. those things really jack conversion rates. Oh up. my! I have to now. I have to tell you, Rob, man, I love you already, man. I, <laughs> if you're not married, I'm I'm, I'm coming this over is, and proposing, man. This is so I great. Live, I live and die by this stuff, guys. This is what I do. This is what I think about all the this time. This is so know? awesome, Jeff. I love Jeff. this stuff, too. I love so, this. There's so many developers. The prices is so easy is. and There's and so many developers, to... so many designers that just kind of go by their gut and, and kind of just put up stuff. And it's slowly changing. You know, we, we're slowly yeah. starting to see that. But it's you, great you that you're out stuff. there. Yeah. So right. the other question I have along with your landing page experiment is, uh, so you're saying you needed validation and you had a price target and you did yeah. the reverse math to figure out what that target was. Um, what about uh, with the original testing? Did you do optimizely or did you, were you doing A-B testing or any messaging testing out uh, of the gate? Very good question. With, with the book one and the uh, uh, conference one, I did not. I have done split many split tests with the drip landing page, okay. including two completely different designs and five mm -hmm. different headlines total. Okay. And uh, what the, the reason I'm doing that, well, well, there's a bunch of reasons, but what I really want to do, since the app is not built yet, I was trying to find out what is the value prop of this thing. Not just what headline works, but what do people really want? So I was writing completely different 
almost describing just a different app. You know, I was yeah. Epic, Epic Autoresponders. Epic Autoresponders is one headline. Yeah. Another headline is let's use email and here's the best practices. It's the one you have there right. to create a double digit jump in your conversion rate. Okay. Then I have a shorter version of that same headline. So these are different things, right? All together. Are you an autoresponder person or do you want to increase conversion rates? Totally different. And okay. so the ones that have won out um, have already, you know, even though we're in the middle of coding it, I already know the language to use to describe so it. So conversion rates tend to be, talking from that perspective, tend to be pretty good? Yep. That's okay. the one that's winning right now. Wow. Well, you're saying more than even just the language. You're saying maybe this is teaching you what features to build, right? That's right. Oh, wow. That's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Beautiful. Oh, so, all right. So uh, I'm going to backtrack a little bit. So we, we've, you've got quite a bit of products. Can you tell us, like, out of the gate, what... what like, was the wedding one, was that, was that the one that kind of started making money? And you're like, okay, something's working. Something's working. Yes. It, it something's was dot, working. It was .NET Invoice. .NET yep. Invoice. Okay. Mm -hmm. Which is invoicing. Really boring niche, right? It's, yeah. I mean, all my niches are boring, but these are the ones that, <laughs> that do the good stuff. So .NET Invoice is, is invoicing software written in ASP.NET. Okay. And I acquired it when it was in alpha from okay. some developers who okay. Okay. didn't know how to market it. And so I, this was about 2005, and this was my first success. I launched a bunch of products, and I was tired of spending six months in the basement, yeah. all my free time. Yeah, right. So I said, you know what? I'm consulting, and I'm right now. I had more money than I had time at right. that juncture, right, right, you right. just because you you making so much per hour, didn't need it to live on, and was just putting all this money in the bank. And I yeah. thought, what am I going to do? Am I going to hire a developer to build this? What yeah. what to yeah. do? Yeah. And I found these guys in a forum. They were trying to to sell it. Mm -hmm. So I acquired it. Um, Wait, hold on, hold on, really quickly. Like, how did you yep. know these guys weren't making that much money? What's how did that whole exchange go? That um, let's see. They they what they actually wanted was a marketing partner, and okay. I'm not big on partnerships, especially with people I don't know. So I said, would you be willing instead to sell it? And they said they'd spent about four or five hundred hours building the app. I yeah. liked the app. I used it. It worked. Okay. Um, and we went back and forth on some numbers they okay. said it was making it just launched it was buggy as hell and okay. I, I didn't know that so that's why I say it was an alpha okay. I like yeah. tested it but you know I didn't I'm not a QA guy so okay. um, they said it was making or it had made like 900 bucks for the past few months and okay. so I did some right. multiple and I was like yeah. gosh I think this thing's worth 10 grand oh, gotcha, so I gotcha. offered him 10 grand I had no way idea how to, how to value these things wow and well yeah and I wound up, <laughs> Wow, so that's a 10x. That's, that's that's more. That's more than a 10x. Um, yeah. What was the opportunity annual. you saw then? The opportunity I saw was to um, was to fix bugs, add features, and go do more SEO and pay per click. I didn't yeah. really know at the time. This is eight years ago, and I was ju I just wanted an app that I could really experiment with and get right. down and dirty right. with. Well, we've, so all seen, well we've, all, we've all seen. we've all we've all seen on uh, you know buy sell ads. There's some other invoicing yeah. one that's really popular. I forget the name of it. Uh, but we, I always see ads. So clearly, if we're seeing a lot of ads for this like one Fresh product, books or something. I think Fresh Books, Fresh yeah, books. Fresh Books. Yeah. yeah so yeah. I always see that. I'm like, God damn it, this is a great category to get in. It's a good niche. Yeah. It's a great niche. It makes money. Uh, clearly, you're still. I mean, are you still doing this? Is it still up? And are you still making money? It is. This? It is still up. It's not a SaaS app. It's a downloadable app. Oh my it's a one-time fee. That's uh, right. So you down, but it's not a desktop app. It's a web app. You download, you install it on a Windows server, and okay. then it is like your own mini FreshBooks. It's like your oh. mini SaaS. Oh, yeah, isn't that funky? I mean, this is 2005. There was no SaaS. Gotcha, no gotcha. one was doing that. Wow. Like there weren't subscriptions. Oh, so this okay. is the one that I really cut my teeth on and got it up to. But between it depended on the month, but between two and five thousand a month. Oh my god, that's to, great! Which was nice, right? Oh, how how long pop. did it take you to ramp up to that, man? Well, the first thing I did the first month, I tripled the pricing. They were charging ninety-eight bucks, okay. and you're, that was just too cheap. So I okay. tripled it to three hundred, and I sold okay. the same amount. Oh wow! And then and then I did some SEO, and then I did some pay-per-click, and then I did some partnerships with web hosts, oh, yeah. and okay. and that was it. So it was within. I was at two grand a month within four months. Oh, probably. that is beautiful! Bang. Yep. Two G's. That was nice. Look it at was that. good. And oh. the, the the problem is though is it's one time, and so it okay. you can't grow past right yeah, that right because yeah, you don't yeah. build every, on the first of every month. Right. There's zero dollars in yeah, revenue yeah, for this yeah. app. Right. How yeah. do you get a traffic source big enough? Yeah, yeah. To keep you going. All right. So what so, was your? Sorry, I don't want to interrupt. What yeah. was your next one? Let's let's move on. 
there there were a bunch of next ones. Um, <laughs> the next there were a bunch of failures. There were some that I bought. I mean, my big goal was to get out of consulting, and of so course. I was every, buying... that's every developer's big goal. I think yep. it's just to get out of consulting, man. <laughs> so I was doing. I I looked at this number. I said, "What do I need to make in a month? Right, Not right. what am I making from consulting, but yeah. what do I need to yeah, live? Just, just to live I exactly." Sold, yeah. I sold a car. I sold five thousand dollars to find on eBay and Craigslist. Like I was trying to amass cash so that I could mm -hmm. get out of it. That's awesome. And so I had this number that I needed to hit in monthly revenue, right. and I was mm -hmm. buying any and everything I could to get there. So I went on Flippa. This is before it was Flippa. It was called right. SitePoint. Yeah, SitePoint, bought, exactly. Yeah. I bought uh, an like an ebook on like raising bonsai trees that was making a few hundred a month. <laughs> That's awesome. I, I bought Apprentice Lineman Jobs, which is at yeah. you know the bottom of the Numa Group website. Which yeah, is yeah. A, so we saw it's that. A job board. Okay. For electricians. Okay. No, no interest in the niche. Okay. But I, I saw opportunity there. Okay. I saw an SEO opportunity, and I 10 x the revenue in about six months. Okay, so that's still up. Is that a subscription, yes. or is that a one-time thing? It is. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's a subscription, but jobs are a trip because people don't subscribe long-term. Your churn is high, right? Okay. Because they, they subscribe for a month, they find a job, they're done. So it's gotcha. more like a one-time okay. fee. Okay. Um, but mm -hmm. it was enough. I cobbled a bunch of things together. I had a, a wedding. No, what was it? Um, a beach towel website that drop ship. I drop ship beach towels. Really? That made a couple grand a month. Oh, I you love know, just it. These things. I, because I didn't care. I didn't. I didn't want to do. Yeah. Uh, I, I didn't care that I was passionate about it. I right. needed to get out of consulting to right. buy my time out. Right, right. So there's Once two. I, yeah, there, there, I'm sorry to interrupt, but there's two camps on this. Steve Jobs' camp, which I've been a big believer, do what you're passionate about because you know yep. you're gonna be doing it for an extended period of time. You gotta love it. And then there's the yep. other one, which is just do what makes money. And make it profitable, and get, maybe get several of these things going, like which because, is what you're doing. And I'm I I am of the second camp. I'm in the do what it takes to get enough time, because to, to do what you're passionate about. Now every day I do what I'm passionate about. But I okay. wouldn't I wouldn't have gotten here without putting in some. What do you call it? It's hard time, basically. Yeah. I mean, it, it was just cobbling together crap that I didn't really right. want to do, but it was mm -hmm. like I needed to hit that number. Right, so the right. day I quit and the next day I didn't have work, right. it was incredible. All of a sudden, I had all this time. I had all I had my 20 hours a week of nights and weekends, plus yeah. I had my 40. During the week, I had 60 yeah. hours. Right then, I started selling. I sold my Beach Towel website. Yeah. I sold mm. several of them okay. because I didn't want to do them long term. They were stepping stones for me. It was a ladder approach. Okay. Mm -hmm. So now I do. I love SaaS apps. I love uh, you know Hittail's an SEO app. Drip right. is an email app. Yeah. Those are the things I'm really passionate about, as okay. well as my book and the, the conference and such. Right, right, right. Well, so, tell me, you've you've got all of these things on your plate. How do you manage? so many projects do you have one at a time were you focusing on on uh you know just the wedding app or just the lineman app or uh, you know just the yep. net app when you yep. were growing it i do i focus on them one at a time i also okay. have a i won't say a staff but it's i have several contractors who work for me i that have is... i was up to eight vas and and designers and developers and such i'm yep. down i downsized to about Five right now. Okay, and, and so and, I have virtual assistants who handle tier one email support and all recurring mm -hmm. tasks. Beautiful, on beautiful, all these beautiful. Apps. I'm a big fan of the Filipinos and Philippines in terms of just customer support. And Jeff, as you know, huge on that. And uh, t tell me about your breakdown. Are you finding the European, the Eastern European programmers, Filipinos as the as the customer support? What what have you found that seems to work? I have. I started really cheap because I didn't have a lot of budget, right. and so I was I was in the Philippines and India, yeah. and have had good luck there. That's I great. have had better luck since I I was able to double and then triple the rate I was able to pay. So going from you know four bucks to twelve bucks an hour, right? Okay. That kind of, of thing. Wow, that's a huge. That, oh, that's huge. It is. Yeah. It is. But it allows you to get a much higher. I don't. I don't know. Like a much better, more experienced person. Of course. Um, as soon as you do that, it opens you up to areas within your time zone, right. which doesn't necessarily need be, mean to be the U.S. Like I have a VA in the in Canada. I have one in Mexico. Yeah. I'm okay. in California. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I also have you know some folks I work with in, in the States, right. and then I still have Philippines, Bangladesh, India, and that. I prefer people to be near my time zone. Of course. Mm -hmm. um, I've just found it better, and the, the cultural fit is also good, but yeah. it is more expensive. You can't get there until you have the money. Again, a stair-step approach. Yeah. I really believe that, right. that you have to start small and then and then mm -hmm. build to that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. What, what are some of the big uh, takeaways with somebody that's watching this show if they want to start hiring their first VAs? What, what are the things that you would suggest that they – uh, be prepared for how they can set themselves up for success. Uh, 
it is definitely a learned skill. You will not get it right the first time. Yeah. It's don't think that you can come in and, and just master this thing because there's so many moving parts in it, both yeah. in screening and hiring and then learning how to delegate. We yeah. don't know how to delegate by nature. As yeah. developers or as designers, yeah. we just don't know how to do that. Right? It's how to hard. It it's hard to let go. It's super really hard to is. let go. It really is. You're like, oh my and God, they're going to totally fuck this up. Ah. Yeah. And then when and they do mess they it do. up slightly, then you're like, ah, oh, fuck it. Forget about this whole idea. This yep. is such a dumb idea. I don't know why Amol even told me about this. Right, right. And that's what some people, their reaction is that, but it's it works. You know, It does, it does work. work. Just because yes. it didn't work the first time doesn't mean it won't work for you. Right. So mm -hmm. I think be prepared to give it some a few tries, you know. I think the second thing is tr try to find someone good and stick with them. I've had VAs working for me for five years. Mm -hmm. They only work five to ten hours a week on right. some s recurring tasks, but I can rely on that. Yeah, and, yeah. and if I have something today mm -hmm. that's going to take yeah. me thirty minutes, right. I can send it to them and know it'll get done. Get done Whereas yeah. if I have to go find a new VA to do that, it's yeah. not. It really isn't worth the time because yeah. the yeah. VA right. screening process is four to eight hours to post and, and all that. Yeah, absolutely. So, That's one of the challenges I've foreseen is just the process of getting going with them and then the chance that you, uh, you know, whatever, they get taken up with some other task and, you know, you lose their skill and their knowledge and the training you've invested in them. Where do you find your VAs? Is it through an Odesk or do you post uh, advertisements or go through your own network or your circles? I have gone through every possible combination of things you can think about. Um, mm -hmm. I, I used to hire from bestjobs.ph. I used yep. Manila Craigslist. Yep, I used, is, yep. yep, I used Craigslist all around the world in yep. India yep. and the Philippines. Um, three other different places. I I am now a wholehearted advocate of Odesk. I I don't think I'll ever go back. Um, be, because of the, the project tracking yeah. and mm -hmm. the, the you know the screenshots the the tracking mm -hmm. of hours there's right. just a lot there's the payment is easy like when I had VAs in, in the Philippines and didn't have yeah didn't have Odesk, PayPal. I, yeah. yeah you have to they don't have PayPal so right. you have to go through these funky weird right. wiring mm -hmm. money and blah yeah. blah blah yeah. Yeah. so that's what I do and until there's a reason not to I actually I've found a VA that wasn't on Odesk and I put them in Odesk and I pay <laughs> Odesk 10 percent you know of their salary every month right. or their just for the hours, tracking yeah just for to have everybody in one place right 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 so very cool very cool all right so rob let's say so you got the the apprenticeship the line the electrician thing you you did the yep. uh you did the dot net thing uh, tell us a little about the wedding I, uh, how did that uh, happen what are you doing with that the yeah so i acquired this one as well a couple years later um it i was thinking I thought it was it's kind of funny, but I was like, you know, I'm going to get into like a SaaS app. And so I bought this, not realizing that A, it's not technically recurring because it's right. just one big one-time fee. And right. B, it's business to consumer. And I had, it's business to consumer is bad. B2C, okay. no, never again. Why, so why, why do you feel that way? The, su the support is high. People's yeah, expectations uh, are just out of like, well, well whoa, I need a phone number. Really I need to call you. Yeah. I need to call you on the phone so you can walk me through this. And it's like, really, for $39, right. you know, right. like one time, there's no chance. Like, yeah. that does not scale. Right. So it's right. not to say that B2C is always bad. I will never do a B2C again. Okay. That, that's good to know. That, that's there's good. also a lot of pricing sensitivity. You okay. uh, cut mm -hmm. consumers buy based on true price, absolute price, yeah. businesses buy based on value. So oh. you can charge a business a thousand bucks, but if you make them two thousand, they don't care. You right. can't charge a consumer a thousand. Yeah, bucks. yeah, they don't, yeah. They're just not. You yeah. know, they don't. They don't value their time like yeah. businesses do. Right, right, right. right. Good point. So, wow, that's a great point. That's a great yeah. point. All right, so are so is that still up? Are you still making money off a wedding toolbox? Yeah, not much, but okay. it's it's there. It's on yeah. it's on autopilot. You know. Okay, that's mm -hmm. cool. That's very cool. What what are you doing? What else is in your? Uh, is in your you know portfolio that is making money subscription wise beyond the micro conference and the yep the there's microconf there's the book that I wrote I mean it's not subscription but it is a, a recurring revenue stream mm -hmm. um, oh you, you do micro... that SEO you got that long tail app that looks pretty cool yep hittail.com yeah, yeah so I've been working on that for the past 21 months okay. and that was another acquisition um, I, I had a formula that, that worked was buy something that was failing right. that I saw potential for and, and revamp it. And so that's what I did. Um, I love that. I think, I think if you go up, but if you go to old.hittail.com, okay. it might show you what it looked like before, um, before your redesign coming up. Yeah. Anyway, so I completely redesigned this and, and yeah, there, yeah, it, is. there it is. Oh my God! So, yes, let's. <laughs> yeah, so that was it. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's a good that stock like photography. They were international, though. <laughs> they were international. Yeah, good, good for them. They had 
10 customers. They spent all that time doing, you know, localization and globalization and, and no one was using it. Oh, that mm -hmm. is hilarious. So. Oh, man, this is a horrible looking site so far. But yeah, you know, good job with that redesign, man. It totally needed it. Thank you. Yeah, they... So we go from that to this. Yeah, wow. Yeah. What a huge difference. Huge. So that that's the thing. You you I plugged holes in the funnel. I redesigned it. I you know shrunk the registration form. I put email marketing into place. You know yeah. um, mm -hmm. you can see in the bottom right there. There's a little orange tab. Yeah. Click that mm -hmm. and it pops up and it says, Hey, we have a yeah. little long tail SEO course. Right. And that has all of these things just compound, you know, and they, it's, it's a very good revenue stream. So this oh, is very cool. This yeah. is fantastic. I love how you have all of your products uh, as, you know, to basically your, your portfolio or your properties online. Yeah. Um, this form you just had me pull up is powered by drip. Yeah. You like that? <laughs> yeah. I mean, so, so to tell us about yeah. that and how many people are using this uh, email capture form and how is that helping your SEO or, you know, uh, outreach efforts? Right, right. So at this point, Drip is on one customer, and that's Hittail. We are dog fooding. Okay. We're still building. Um, okay, so great. this is the first app I've built from scratch in about six or seven years. Mm, wow. And the reason has been is that you can move so much faster when you acquire. You know, yeah. you can you get to product market fit instantly right. Right, right, by right. buying an app that already yeah. has it. You yeah. just need some cash. Very good but point. with Drip. With Drip, I saw this need in the market, and it was, you know, the entrepreneurial itch never goes away of wanting right. to create your own stuff. So right, right, right. that's that's what Drip is is okay. is an idea. And I, the first thing I did was I, before we wrote a line of code or before I got a landing page up, was I emailed uh, a group. It was 17 different founders that I know, and I said, "Here's the bullet list of what it will do. Will you pay $99 a month for this?" Oh, um, yeah. And and I got 11 of them who said yes. And okay. so that's the day we broke ground and we started. Uh, how coding. do you know they're not giving you wow. lip service? They like you. They want to be your friend. Yeah. How do you know that they're being real, man? Well, two things. One, I said, "Are you sure?" I replied to every one of them, <laughs> and I said, "Are you sure?" Because when yeah. it launches, I'm going to count on you to sign up. Ah. And I got them to double. They double opted in. They double yeah, opted they in. Oh, I like that. So I can't guarantee that they're going to do it, but that's mm -hmm. really not the point. I wanted to know that there was a need there. Okay. You know. Yeah. Um, the second thing is. Uh, I don't know what the second thing is. Yeah, that was it. That was the need. Well, so, yeah, the, the double opt-in is great. I mean, sometimes people will give you the lip service, but when it comes to pulling out the wallet, they don't actually yeah. follow through sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And so all 11 of them won't sign up, I'm sure, but that's not really the need, you know? Mm -hmm. Okay. So that was it. So then we started building, and we have we put it on Hittail about six weeks ago, and then we put it on customer number one. We started working with him, and we realized that my customer number one had a very complex use case, and so we're about three weeks in building mm -hmm. features he needs mm -hmm. and realized, like, we're going down a rabbit hole. So we're in yeah. customer development is really where it is, and we could launch. We're going to launch sometime in the next month or two. Okay. Um, but, you know, in the meantime, the email list is growing, and we're learning a lot about, you know what what exactly it is we want to build and the exact features we're going to that's implement because right now great. it's basically an MVP it works you can see it work right. mm -hmm. if you sign up there you'll get the emails right. it's just what does the back end look like and what's the onboarding and, and all that other stuff right 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 all that important stuff that's super important yep. yeah, yeah. yeah very the cool nice part is I've implemented this on three of my apps okay. not drip specifically but right. the this idea of a of a mini course yeah okay. a mini autoresponder that educates yeah. that doesn't sell at all it's right. purely an education educational yeah mm -hmm. and every time i've improved my conversion rates between 10 and 30 percent oh so autoresponder so sequences work yeah there's no doubt big 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 big, it's a big, big flywheel and yeah. let me uh, that's very good you're bringing up uh, a, a topic near and dear to my heart man i love autoresponders especially for educational purposes yeah uh, where have you noticed in the in the stream if you notice three five messages in that's when they tend to okay i'm ready to sign up or uh, how long are your email sequences do you go for 12 15 how many weeks do you space apart each email to, give us a little bit more detail on that yep yep so i have tested um in general the Third, what was it? The we, uh, a friend of mine just tested the exact same seven emails, and it was in seven days or thirty days, and the thirty days converted better. Oh. So now mm. I have to go test that though, because if you go to the Hittail one right now, it's yeah. seven in seven days. So now okay. I need to go test. That's okay. one thing. The other thing is I o I only go five to seven emails. Okay. Um, only because mm. twelve to fifteen, it's like you you start getting that diminishing returns, right? You okay. get sign up, sign up, sign up, and then yeah. it's a lot of work to put together that many emails. So right. I try to keep it short. Yeah. Um, I also try to to title it as a mini course, right? It's it's like a, something you're giving away, right. and so it's not just a 
a newsletter that's going to continue forever. Because right. if you want to do that, go to MailChimp. Like, go use MailChimp or Aweber. Like, okay. mm -hmm. the, specifically, these things are purely to educate and get someone to try your app. And okay. so, the sh kind of the shorter, the better, between five and seven. Okay. Um, I do see a, there's a big spike with the first email, and there's a big spike with the seventh email when I say this is the last email uh, you'll be getting. Okay. Da, 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 da. So there's a big uh, spike on both ends. Now, there are some spikes in the middle as we, you know, different tactics that we're using to, we'll have an image and people, a lot of people click through on that one. But okay. in general, you tell them this is the first one and here's what to expect. And right. then the last one, this is it. You're not going to receive any more in this course. Okay. And right. people then realize, ah, I'm not going to be reminded. <laughs> right, right. So, Let me get in there. Right, right. Yeah. Okay. So, have you experimented with possibly leading up to a webinar and then group selling? Have you thought about any of that? That would be a great idea. Um, I may do that with Drip. I've never had the price point to warrant that. Okay. Yet, like okay. Hittail is just not. I don't have the time to do that. Okay. Um, I would need to either hire someone or, or something like that. So right, that's right. more of a medium touch or high touch sale. And okay. uh, I know you can grow business faster that way, but it's not something that I have room in my life to do. Gotcha. You know, I'm working right. on too much stuff to do. But right. I absolutely think that would convert like yeah. crazy. Yeah, no, it, it, really it totally am. works, man. Uh, but yeah. A lot of people are now are doing this sort of webinar, and then they do the replay, so people aren't even clicking through because they're yes. oh, they're gonna do the replay, so I won't show up. So that's it. You gotta. It's tricky to let them know, hey, this is live. This is not going to be replayed again, so you need to show up at a certain time. And yep. And so you're, you're talking about different strategies uh, with email marketing and drip emails and sequences. How much of the strategy and templates and stuff can you build in to get drip for the users, or is it going to mainly be a tool for dispatching the messages? No, that's exactly what we want to do: is is build best practices into the tool awesome. because we we can't compete. We have no desire to compete with Mailchimp, Aweber, Campaign Monitor, uh, Constant Contact. Yeah. They're mm -hmm. huge, yeah, they're right? Huge. And there's yeah. no reason to. Right. They fill their niche really well. What we they, they don't even have a niche; they're horizontal. We mm -hmm. want to fill that niche of you want to get this stuff going really fast and I already have the templates laid out at a high level of cool. you, as you're signing up you just want a, a three step completely generic hey right. touching base yeah. then click this one button Beautiful. poof you're populated right I, I want it. like templates the next mm -hmm. one is poof but then you have to add some content I'm gonna it. recommend you go to a blog you know it's that kind of stuff right it's love it's a it. wizard that's what love we want to build into the tool. almost like camp uh, almost like templated cool. campaigns is what you're yes. saying that's yep. exactly right. Yeah, well, this is great. I mean, because you know, as a layman here listening to the best practices, like you're saying, over 30 days versus seven, all yep. this stuff. You know, if I'm coming to you guys, it's because I'm not an expert at that. Yep. I think it's great if you can offload not just the technology, but the sort of strategy end of it, and That's the you know, idea. let me bring the content. So you know, sort of like you're saying, it sounds like you might have an outline of a course educational series, and I can go put my expertise and fill it in and generate a, a nice uh, sequence of emails to my customers. Exactly. Cool. I, I want to actually uh, segue a little bit here. Um, I, did, were, did you get a chance to watch any of the keynote, uh, the Google I/O? Um, uh, I did. Yeah, and I heard recaps of it as well. Okay. What what is uh, what, what struck me about that? And I want to get your feedback. Uh, was uh, not Sergey, but what's his what's his partner? Uh, Larry. Larry. Yeah. So Larry was on there, and Larry had mentioned several a couple of times during. I think his keynote where he'd mentioned that that technology is not a zero sum game there's room for multiple players. He mentioned that a couple of times in his speech and it struck me because uh you know I, I tend to think sometimes it is a zero sum game and I tend to be like all right we got to grab all the market this is it we can't have any competitors. What's your feeling on that? Do you think there's room for multiple types of startups that do uh drip campaigns for 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 startups at multiple wedding building websites and what's your feeling on all that stuff? Yeah, I mean there definitely is that in every market there's going to be a number of competitors and that's actually maybe a mistake people make early on is they think that they have to enter a market with no competition. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, absolutely. Even within the drip space, there's already a, a slew of them. Now they're servicing a slightly different niche or a slightly different market or a slightly different, you know, this or that. Yeah. So you do, you want to be differentiated. You don't want to be a commodity. There's yeah. a difference between competition and commoditization. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. It's like there are a number of uh, email providers, but you do know that MailChimp is, 
tends to be more startup friendly. Their API is really good. Blah blah blah. They're right. differentiated from Aweber, even though they kind of do the same thing. Yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. So, email marketing is not a, a commodity, and I think, um, yeah, what Larry said totally makes sense, right? Yeah. So you're 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 a fan of that. So uh, so if somebody obviously you're you're going into the email space. So the email space is huge. You've got these big competitors. For my first thought when I saw this, I was like, wow, what a beautiful landing page. Then my second thought was like, how are these guys going to be different than Aweber and, and, and yep. all, all that? So he, I'm surprised. Get creamed is your, is your second thought. They're yeah. going to get creamed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but then I clicked through and I learned more about you. I'm like, oh, wait a second. This guy knows what he's doing. Uh, right. Oh, I remember this micro uh, conference. And I was like, wait, you know, he, he's. Yeah, so clearly you're going to build in maybe within your UI how you're different. I noticed you didn't put that up sent up in, you know, up in front on your landing page. This is why we're different than Aweber. And I'm curious as to why you didn't do that. Are you, are you thinking about doing that? No, not well. In the ultimate marketing website, we will have an FAQ section or we'll have part of the tour. We'll say this is how we're different. But mm -hmm. on this landing page, I want to do two things. One, I want to build curiosity. Uh, the first thing is I want to provide some value, right? So that's what the headline does. Is it's like, if you don't want what's in the headline, you should not sign up for this, period. So right. see it. And if mm -hmm. that gets you to read the first sentence, then it does. Yeah. So then what I try to do is build a little bit of curiosity. I don't actually give you all the step-by-step the -step of how we're going to do it because mm -hmm. that is the reveal right the reveal will happen in the coming months as I start to email this list which I have already sent one out okay. so I want to say here's what we can give you it doesn't really matter at this point how we're gonna do that mm -hmm. it just this is if you want this end result this is what it's gonna do mm -hmm. and so I don't want to spend a bunch of time building along not even my time I just don't think it's actually valuable I don't think it will improve opt-ins if I went into a, a long you know uh, explanation of how we're different and all that stuff um, I think people will, will lean towards opting in rather than trying to go and do a bunch of research on it. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Well, uh, if, if you had to give anybody that's watching a tip to maybe go on flippa.com to find a property that needs to be rehabbed, what would you, how, how oh, let's say Jeff tomorrow says, you know what, Rob is right on the money, man. I'm tired of programming for cash. I'm going to find some cool little app that hasn't been marketed. What, what, where were some of the places he should be looking? What some of the things, questions should he be asking when he emails these guys? Uh, give us a couple of pointers there. Flippa is, oh man, it's a mess. It is. A it, mess. Is, it is. It is it's so. A, there's so much crap and on there. A lot, of, a lot of scam artists on Flippa. I know. So. I know. That's the thing. So, a couple things. I have. I used to buy stuff on Flippa. I haven't in a while. It's not to say it's done or it's jumped the shark or anything. It's just you really have to spend time. You, I mean, I would spend 20 to 30 minutes every day yeah. going through the most recent, following them, favoriting them, yeah. bidding mm -hmm. on them, blah, blah, blah. It, it unto itself is like an effort. So yeah. it don't, don't think that it's a shortcut necessarily. You know, you could almost be writing code during that time and, and get a lot done. Right, sure. Um Flippa, you can find stuff, but everyone's competing in this sub five thousand dollar market because everyone says, "Well, I have two thousand bucks to acquire an app," and it's like, "Ugh, there's going to be a lot of people." So until you can get ten uh, above ten grand, okay. it's hard to okay. really that's, get that's good. A good that's a good point. So you need about a ten k budget to go after some meaty meaty apps that are on Flippa. Okay. Yeah, for the most part. Um, the second thing is I have had recently. Decent luck. Like the way I bought Hittail was I cold emailed the owner of Hittail. I emailed her. I went and mm -hmm. I did my search. I went out and sought them mm -hmm. and sought them out. And so that's a, an approach I recommend people I do. That. I also think I people uh, on forums and stuff, like people are posting all the time about I need marketing help or, mm -hmm. which is can be a key of, hey, can I acquire your app? Yeah. Uh, or um, people are talking about, you know, trying to form partnerships or to sell their apps. Very cool. So how did you find Hittail first? Would you, where'd you, how'd you discover them? I was a, I've been a customer since 2006 when they started. And oh. I had, I have with the blog and with .NET Invoice and I've always been an SEO guy and Hittail's right. an SEO tool. So I just used it for years and years. Okay. And then they started having outages in 2010, 2011. Okay. About every, every couple of months they'd have a two day outage. And so I was oh, like, no. what's going on with these guys? <laughs> so. Know. So it's nice to be a customer of a, of a failing service if, in fact, you yeah. do feel like you could revitalize it, you know? Wow. Okay. <laughs> Intimate yeah. knowledge of the product and such as well. Yeah. 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 Very, very cool. Okay. Uh, so clearly uh, reaching out to the SaaS uh, developers directly, uh, avoiding Flippa listings, that might be a good way to go. Um, yeah, I mean Flippa. Yeah, I still recommend Flippa, but it just don't think you're gonna buy a SaaS app in in three months. It's gonna take months and months because mm -hmm. there's just not a lot of good ones come along. You know? Right. 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 Mm -hmm. 
Okay, that's cool. So maybe maybe uh, maybe basically scouring some older TechCrunch articles, looking for some SaaS uh, totally startups would. back in two thousand eight, two thousand nine. I've maybe? done that. I've done that exact thing. Yeah. Oh, really? <laughs> I totally have. Yeah. Yep. Um, okay. The other thing, there's two other things you can do. One is flipfilter.com, which okay. is a service that helps you filter Flippa stuff to really mm -hmm. make cut down on your, you know, your need for, for to track it every day. Yeah. And then there, there's actually an ebook I need to recommend. It's called How to Buy a oh. or it's How to Buy a Website.org. It's written by a friend of mine named Dave. Uh, I wrote the foreword to the book. It's the best ebook I know about buying apps on Flippa. He's bought a bunch of them. Okay. He was kind of a, a mentee of mine, and now he's like better than me at it. So, <laughs> um, yeah. This, this is so great. This kind of reminds me of that cool. sh that show on cable where you flip houses and rehab them, flip them. Totally. This is it's it's definitely yeah. You know. That, oh, that's the other thing I'd say is you need to have flexibility. You need to be willing to buy something like a beach towel website, or maybe like an ebook, or maybe like a wedding website builder, like something that isn't exactly what you want to do yeah. in order to get in the game and start mm -hmm. learning and have an early victory. Like if you're really stuck on, I want a SaaS app in the email marketing space, good luck. Right, like right. you're going to wait years to find yeah, it. So the yeah, broader yeah. you can, you can, you know, have yeah. your interests. Better. I have a question for you regarding uh, traffic. So uh, we had this uh, great guy, uh, great guest. His name is Max Teitelbaum. He was one of the top uh, in interviews on Mixergy. He uh, runs What Runs Where. Uh, basically, it, it does um, you know display ad uh, monitoring. So it scrapes all the display ads. So you can see who's running ads on where on what network. Um, you know, do you are you a big believer in possibly going directly to websites and buying display ads directly to them? Media buying as a way of generating traffic, as opposed to pay per click and you know all that kind of thing or cost per click. Um, I will say, I so I could see doing this. I could see it working. I do believe in that. I mean, advertising works. I've done it. I have apps that have grown substantially from advertising. I have tended to use net, uh, marketplaces like buy sell ads, okay. where I don't have to deal directly with the um, with the, the end user because I don't want to have a bunch of these fragmented relationships. They just take more time. Yeah, and if yeah. you're scaling an app and growing it thousands of dollars a month, right. saving that 20% commission from buy sell ads right. is it's irrelevant. It's, 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 it's not, not the smart way it. of thinking. Right, right. In addition, ads have what's called ad rot or or ad um, decay, right. where mm -hmm. they just don't work. Yeah. forever on a right. same website. So even right. when I've gone through buy sell ads, I'll yeah. buy them for a month, yeah. then I'll stop them. And then I'll find new sites or I'll, I'll do whatever. You really have to change things up. And um, unless they have a huge amount of inventory, yeah. even if you change the actual visual, yeah. you're just going to get the same people clicking yeah, and it doesn't yeah. work forever. So oh, that's, that's a like. really good tip. So it's to keep cycling them through the different sites on the network because yes. their loyal audiences will get tired of looking at that same ad. Exactly. And that's where going one-on-one -on -one, is in my mind could be wasted time because gotcha. you're investing a bunch of time to set up this yeah, relationship yeah, that yeah. doesn't save you that much money right. and it um and you don't really want to run on it every month anyways so wow wow so uh, what do you know uh, Jeff and I have talked about possibly doing a, a a conference or some sort of we're thinking about how to monetize what what are some big early lessons pitfalls that you're willing to share with us uh, about putting on your uh, micro conf like what, what our to, event. Yeah. Our yeah. Event, yeah. <laughs> oh man, it it is so much work. It is an unbelievable amount of work. Really? Like, okay. Oh my gosh, it is. It's, <laughs> well, it depends on how big you make it too. I bet if you did mm -hmm. fifty people, okay. it'd be less work. But we, you know, we did a hundred and five the first year, and then a hundred and hundred and five speakers or attendees no, or attendees. Hundred and five okay. attendees. Yeah, the speakers were in there too. I think we had ten, so it was like okay. ninety five attendees and ten speakers. Okay. And then one fifty, and then one sixty. Is okay. been the numbers. Um. It, there are so many details, including feeding people, getting badges printed, getting swag, you know, swag to give away, getting okay. raffle stuff. There's just all these getting people to work a registration desk, okay. picking up food, like things you don't really want to be doing, right, right. but but they have to get done. So right. I think for us, one the first year was completely bootstrapped, right. and if you're gonna do one, I would say. Um, Pick a venue, get a get a verbal yes from that venue, and okay. say, "All right, I just need to sort some stuff out." Right. Then go try to market it like we did, like get a landing page up, mention it on the podcast, and right. be like, "Guys, we're throwing a conference. Go right. to you know our conference.com and and sign up." And right. if you find, and then try to get on Hacker News, try to get it you know wherever else yeah. you can, tweet right. it out. Right. And if mm -hmm. you get 
20, 30 emails, then you know you shouldn't put on a conference. That's not enough, you know. <laughs> we got 600, I think, when we did it the first year, and that I wanted 800. Wow. You know? And we almost didn't put the conference on. Wait, hold on a second. Yeah. So 800, out of the 800, I, I might get 15% converted and actually plunked down, pulled out the credit card? No, out of those initial, we had 600 on there, 550 or 600 okay. on the, the first year. I wanted 800, but we converted, I'm trying to think, did we convert 50? I think we converted 50 from that, and okay. then we sold another, the remaining over the next two months or three months. Oh, wow. Okay, so a 10% so it, conversion off those initial emails, basically. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow, well, that's very interesting. That's yeah. Holy cow. I have to tell you, man, uh, I, I, I'm looking forward to hanging up with you and watching those old videos from last year, man, because I, I really, it, was, it, it's it looked really cool. Yeah, yeah, there's the really good talks in there. Definitely, yeah. definitely check them out. Yeah, yeah. So uh, what have you, uh, what was it like, man? I mean, getting all these guys there physically, like, uh, were you, did you have them, like, uh, where, was it in Vegas? Or did you have them yep. uh, picked up all, all at once? Or how did that happen? Did you send out a car? Like, No, we, um, we just post uh, when they buy through Eventbrite, they get a confirmation email and it says um, there are shuttles from the airport to the hotel. Like everybody gets there themselves, you know, okay. and okay. Vegas is a great Vegas. I'm not a big fan of Vegas, but it's a great town to have a conference in because it's so easy to get yeah. around. It's cheap to get in and out right, right. by yeah. air yeah. and it's $7, you know, shuttles to like right. all along the strip. That's right. That's mm -hmm. right. And that was it. So once yeah. we had the venue, we said, be there at this time, right. figure, you know, you're all grown ups. So right. they all figured themselves out. And then right. we had a block of rooms that, that they could buy from right. at a discounted rate. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that was really it. The more hand-holding, like the white glove treatment we yeah. did was speakers. We wanted the okay. speakers really – because these okay. are all very successful. Yeah, yeah, of course. All right, yeah. so how, how did you handle the speakers? What, 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 what kind of stuff did you do with these guys? Yep. So the first thing we do – part of being a speaker, these guys are – how do I say this tactfully? They don't need, like, we can't pay them oh, because it's bootstrap and yeah. they have more money than they know what to do with. Like, yeah, exactly. these guys, some of these guys are multimillionaires yeah. and will never need to work again. Right, right, Most right. of them are actually. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, absolutely, so, man. You've got some money, big ballers on here. Yeah. yeah. So, any money we can give them is irrelevant. To right. Them, right. Mm -hmm. what, what they want is they want a couple things. They want to network with. And I, I network's a crappy word, but it's like they want to meet and mingle with other really interesting people. Okay. And so, number one, that's other speakers. And okay. number two, that's the attendees. And then number okay. three, they just want to come and have people listen to them because that's fun. That's you know, cool. it's a nice that's little ego stroke. Right. So the first thing we did right. for the speakers to hang out is we do a speaker dinner and we take okay. just the twelve speakers out okay. to mm -hmm. a you know oh, a that's nice. two two thousand dollar dinner. I mean it's like bottles of wine, filet mignon, it's any lobster, anything you want. We go Whoa. to this restaurant. Okay. And but that's it. That's what we don't pay them, right? That's how we're paying them. We pay for their flight and their oh, hotel. Okay, gotcha. And then this is it. This is their payment right. for coming. Mm -hmm. And and they feel like VIPs. Like they feel really that's you know, cool. definitely really that's cool. good. And then we um have evening events where you know everybody gets to to talk to them and uh they they get to mingle with the attendees and the attendees are really high quality attendees so it right. they actually mm -hmm. enjoy it that's so, awesome so uh, what have, what was one of the big surprises from from doing this what is like oh my god i never this this big it's an awesome like uh event that or something happened afterwards or during that you never expected that was good positive i didn't so the first year it was really really hard to get people to come and speak and to buy tickets and to do anything. It was just, it was even with our audience, all the blog people that read my blog, all the book sales, all the podcast listeners, right. it was still just like pulling teeth to get people to attend. Okay. The second year we sold out in, I think it was 10 days. And the third year we sold out in 51 hours. Wow! I did not yes. expect the momentum to build that quickly. Right. That's mm -hmm. like, I mean, that's an exponential curve right there. And I wow. honestly never expected it. We're actually doing, one in Europe, in uh, you know what? Prague. To your credit, Australia. though, Rob, I, 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 I have a feeling that this stuff, this, this the being there has got to be amazing. It's got to be incredible. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. You it's, know, and, it's and, and now that you're releasing the here. videos, they'll be shared by other people. It's just uh, this yeah. could really turn into a big revenue source for you, man. Yeah, hopefully. The first year we basically broke even. Second year we made a few grand, and this year we did better. We definitely made money, made enough to make it worthwhile. So, okay. Okay. Um, I don't, I don't view this as a as like a big revenue source, but it is. I it definitely is its own brand, and I think that if we treat it well, and that it can definitely you know grow over the years. What's your What's the right. next thing for MicroConf? You mentioned Europe. What other things are you thinking yep. about doing with the site or? Yeah, um, for MicroConf itself? Yeah, MicroConf. Um, so 
yeah, Europe is the next thing. It's in October. Um, I don't know if we want to go to more than two conferences a year. You know, mm -hmm. we don't really want to grow the conference. Though is the trouble that the some part of the beauty of it is that it is in fact a small okay. conference. Like okay. we we haven't grown it past 160, and it's intimate. You can meet almost everyone at the conference okay. in the in the three days that we're there, okay. and that's a unique thing. We could we had 60 something people on our wait list when oh. we you know, that we just never let in. So we could grow over 200 instantly, probably to 220, mm. 250. Okay. Um, but we really want to avoid that. So I think what's next is continuing to, like selling out quickly has allowed us a lot of time to do interesting things at the conference, like to have attendees do some really awesome attendee talks, to okay. just do more planning and allows us more time that we don't have to be marketing, selling tickets, we can okay. now devote towards planning. So, Wow. Uh, do you f could you possibly use this as a launch board to, to bringing uh, certain exhibitors that maybe show up that may have SaaS type products to sell, possible founders, new founders, that kind of thing? You thinking about that at all? I don't know. I mean, so we have sponsors, okay. right, who, who do uh, pay for, they pay for mentions on the website, on the podcast, at the event, and they show up. They buy, they often buy tickets. What has happened, especially this year, was these, a startup would find out about us and they'd want to come, but they were sold out. So then they'd sponsor us so that they could buy these tickets because right. we—that's the only tickets we had left, you know. <laughs> so then they'd show up. So they weren't exhibiting per se. Right. I think the year we have tables, the the point at which we have an exhibit hall is the year that Microconf has failed. Like I don't think we'll ever do that, honestly. <laughs> okay. Really? Um, okay. Yeah, because it's all, it's much more, it's not about us know, and them. It's I not know. about sitting on this side of the right, table right. and yeah, pitching. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. There's no real mm -hmm. pitching, but it, right. but the sponsors show up and they mingle just like, because yeah, we're all yeah. doing the same thing. We're right. all startups. Yeah, we're so all I'm not startups, trying to yeah. tell you, you right. know, I don't try to sell anyone on Hittail or Drip. Okay, right. It's nothing like that. I'm just having conversations okay, saying this, I have a, you yeah. know what I'm saying? This is a it, really it, important distinction, man. It, it, yeah. You're really, this is a whole, this is almost, it almost feels like an advertorial, like sponsored posts almost, like where it's more of a soft, sell or like not even sell or yeah i haven't even uh, to be honest i haven't even thought of it as that as as a soft seller and advertorial um it really is just people like the sponsors who come back want to be affiliated and associated with what microconf represents which is making changes making the difference in people's lives who want to start a startup and typically get out of consulting yeah. or mm -hmm. grow their startup from from one person to maybe a handful but they're all lifestyle businesses we're not right, right. we're not b2c you know venture capitalists we're all yeah. self-funded yeah. and so we're all in the same boat and so mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess that's that's the extent that I've thought about it. I know that sounds like some type of philosophical thing or whatever, but uh, that's yeah. it. Really, is the the goal of no? You know, it's really great. On. Jeff and I are in that that your, this, your sweet spot, man. We're yeah, both. So I mean, yeah, I mean, I think it's awesome that you have all these projects and products and uh, properties. Really, can you tell us real quick? Let me rewind to the Numa Group. How how did you start the Numa Group, and who does it consist of? And you know oh. how how are you uh, you know collect, you know keeping a, a reign over all of these products that yeah, you have under yeah, that umbrella? Great question. Sure. So the Numa Group is just an umbrella LLC. That's all it is, right? It's just a, a something because I have to file taxes, okay. mm -hmm. and it's something has to own all these apps. Right. Um, the Numa Group started. It was when I was a consultant. I, it was a consulting firm, and then when I stopped okay. consulting, it stopped being that. So it owns technically all of these things. Although I own the copyright to my book legally, and you know, I mean, there's all those. Sure. Little, it's legal jargon, but uh -huh. I am the I'm the hundred percent owner of the Numa Group. I have one. I am a W-2 employee of the Numa Group since it is an LLC. I also have mm -hmm. one other W-2 employee who's my product manager and a developer. Um, oh, cool. He was a full-time contractor for a long time and then needed to buy a house and they wouldn't sell him a house with 1099. So I said, okay. well, let's do W-2. Like, yeah, right. <laughs> and it was, cool. So one, one W-2 and then there are five 1099 contractors around the world who I use uh -huh. consistently every month. Some of them mm -hmm. it's 20, 30 hours a month and some of them it's full-time. So those are the people I would list. If I had a personnel page, which I don't, um, those are the people I would list. And they're like tier one email support, designer, developer. Oh, this is um, great. Kind of this, is, uh, cool. this is the nitty gritty oh. stuff that's yeah. really how, helpful. How has it had, uh, having this uh, umbrella, has it provided any advantages or any interesting insights there? Like any cross promotions? I noticed you had the powered by drip kind of thing. Uh, any advantages like that, or like a, I, you know, I really admire what you've done here. It's a huge undertaking. Like I already mentioned, you know, how do you juggle having so many projects and focusing is such a challenge. Sure. Um, yeah, the juggling projects does come back to having good people, bottom line, and having people who've stuck with me for years. The okay. cross promotion to date, 
there I've had no crossover with my software apps. I think Hittail and Drip are the first two that will have any crossover where the audience will be the same. Okay. That is a, I won't say it's a mistake because I was acquiring apps and you just can't be picky about what you acquire. Yeah, I couldn't right. acquire apps in the same space. If I was building apps from scratch, yeah. every app would have been to the same audience. Different, right. you know, it's like Crazy Egg and Kiss Metrics, right? right? right, right like, right. and Kiss Insights, yeah, like those yeah. guys did. Yeah. Uh, that's the software side. The teaching side, where it's my book, mm -hmm. conference, podcast, that's all of that is, it's a one ecosystem. Right. People yeah. find me from any of those five places, right. book, podcast, startup, uh, you know, blog, um, conference, and then they wind up doing all the other ones is what tends to happen. Mm -hmm. so tons so, of overlap there. So my big question to you here, Rob, is you met all these attendees, you've had the speakers there. What are some big glaring holes in the marketplace, in the education space that, that these at home or you know people that are trying to get out of consulting, what is the one thing that they're missing, lacking, uh, glaring areas that, that need you know, educational products or even SaaS products? What, uh, are there any insights that you've had? You know, any th any hole that I've seen, I've tried at least to start filling in some form or fashion. Of course. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and so that's like when I saw that there was just kind of people milling around trying to do what we're all doing. Yeah. That's when I wrote the book was to try mm -hmm. to gather a little bit of uh, of those folks together. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Are you looking for like specific trouble that they have? Maybe, maybe. I, anything just, on the horizon that's interesting. I think the biggest trouble most developers have trying to get this going is to find an idea and settle on it and, and mm -hmm. be able to commit to it. Mm -hmm. And so I think that I know there's a couple, but I tend to be, I'm okay at that, but I'm not a guru at like the, the kind of front end coming up with ideas, customer development type stuff. Um, okay. I, I, I've done it, but I know more by reading others than by actually being some type of guru in it. Gotcha. So I think there's a big need there. I think if someone put out a killer mm. book or, or video or something, that that would okay. be the niche that I would aim so at. So some sort of ideation and customer development thing. More, more specific things. You know, more specific steps on how to do that. I've read Running Lean with by Ash Maria, and yeah, yeah. there's a great book called Cold Calling Book. It's at coldcallingbook.net. It's okay. all about finding your idea. Um, mm -hmm. Dane Cook with the foundation does right. it. You know, oh, yeah. I was going to mention it. Dane Cook. Yeah, I was going to say. Uh, yeah, he, he's probably one of the more prominent dudes yeah. doing it. Um, yeah, yeah. But I, I still feel like there's, there's a... a need for more education. I have to tell you, area. when Dane came on Mixergy, man, I was just like, light bulbs, light bulbs, light bulbs. Like, I was jumping up and down, like, so, like, and then he's like, and then pause and then ask him, what else? And right, then right. ask him, what else? And then on the third, what else, is when they really talk about their pain and you really start writing this stuff down. I, when I heard that, man, you don't understand, Rob, I was just like, oh my God, this guy, yes! Crack yep, the so code. Finding the, prob finding the problem is the hardest thing sometimes. Yeah, yeah it's, I'd say it's the, uh, not the hardest, but it's the most common roadblock I see is mm -hmm. people can't find the problem, can't settle mm -hmm. on an idea, can't commit to an idea. And mm -hmm. so that's a big gap in the market. Now, here's the thing, though. Five years ago, that wasn't a gap in the market. It was we didn't know how to, how to do landing pages, and people didn't know about split testing, and people didn't know about all this other stuff, but those have slowly been filled in ways that, really work now and there is optimizely and there is education on split testing there is education on hiring VAs yeah. those holes are being filled which is great because it allows us to stand on the shoulders of those guys right, right. right. I mean I was one of the guys that started doing a bunch of stuff but it allows us to stand on the shoulder of each other I'll say yeah. um, so that we're going to raise the bar and that as these holes get filled we come up with new hardest you know pain points for us so so you know I have we have Ash actually coming on in a couple of weeks what, 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 should, what kind of questions should we be asking this guy um, well, I think you should check out his book. I really, I was like one of the technical reviewers. I'm a friend, Ash is a friend of mine. Um, I really like his book and, and the process he takes in there of basically trying to get to an idea and trying to get to precisely what you should build. Not just the idea, but the actual solution. You can okay. find a problem. Mm -hmm. yeah. Finding a problem is, is hard. Right. Finding this or figuring out exactly what to build to solve that problem is also very hard. Mm -hmm. And his book mm -hmm. walks through both of those things. So if nothing else, try to skim his book or at least get an idea of what's in it right. and ask him about some specific things. Because I and I'd also yeah. like to know, you know, because he's doing that right now. He's used it a couple times. I'd okay. love to hear about more about his experience doing it and about awesome. others. I mean, I, I love real life experiences. Do, you, know? do you what's what? What are your thoughts about like near field technology, the Internet of Things, putting sensors into 
lots of different places as a way of building the product market fit. You know, if you're going and approaching a chiropractor, for example, maybe you can plug in some sensors into his bench. Or if you're approaching a pool cleaner, which I know the foundation guy talks about, uh, using the smartphone as a way of tr triggering, you know, whether the kid was there cleaning the pool or not. You know, sure, what's sure. your thoughts on all that? I think, yes, I think that's the future. Um, I think we're too early right now for bootstrapped founders to tackle that. Okay. You have to have funding to push the, to go bleeding edge. You have to be bigger. You have to have a team and you have to have funding. I, I don't want to say have to. In my opinion, right now, it'd be really, really hard to do that. When you're one guy in a basement and you have 15 hours a week because you have your salary gig right. and a wife and a kid right. and you need to get to revenue very quickly, okay. you need to get to eight or 10 grand a month. That's pretty much the number for everybody. Right, right. When you get, get there, you can quit. Your, it's somewhere in there almost for right. almost everybody if you live yeah. in the state. Right. That, getting to that number is um, when you're bootstrapped is critical. Yeah. And the, the near field stuff, yes, down the line, it'll be great. Um, but I'm going to let other people take the arrows in the back who have millions yeah. of dollars in funding, right? right and then hop yeah. on it later. So right, right. I think sticking to, to software for now is, is, is a better approach for a bootstrapper, especially for yeah. a first time entrepreneur. Okay. Wow. Okay. That's good. That's good to know. Uh, I typically get excited about the new and shiny things. Uh, but, uh, yeah, that can yeah. lead you down well, a rabbit. It can. And you pay attention, pay attention to it. Cause I'm certainly not some, I don't want to claim to be some guru on the subject either, but the more I hear about it, the more I'm like, this is going to be big in a couple of years, you know, right, and right, until right. it's big, yeah. there's no, there's no room to make eight to 10 grand a month on it. And until you can make eight to 10 grand a month on something to quit your job, it's just not, it's not worth doing. What, what are your thoughts about Kickstarter and that role in the eight to 10 grand a month? Uh... Yep. I think Kickstarter, well, so Kickstarter is hard. It's hard to fund software through Kickstarter. They do mostly creative projects. I've heard a lot of software getting rejected, actually. Very few have gone through. Um, mm -hmm. But there are platforms like App Backer with no E. App okay. back, B A C K R. There's okay. if you search for like Kickstarter for apps, there's like four of them, four or five of them. Hmm. I think it's a, I think it's a good idea. I think it's a more f than for revenue. I think it's a great idea to test the market, right? Because there's right. a there's a group of people there who do want to use software and buy it. Right. So sure, test the market. You have you have nothing to lose by going to them, you know. Right. Um. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that'd be my that'd be my thing. I think the earlier you can prove the idea, meaning pre code, the earlier you can figure out that that you're going to actually be able to make a little bit of money from it so so jeff uh, could, you know i jeff's background a little bit earlier he was doing like a fit it was working with a fitness company they were doing a mobile fitness tracking thing like mm -hmm. uh what's your thought with the fi just specifically with the fitness let's say niche because that's one of the largest big niches on the internet do you sure. do you see uh, any room there for a SaaS player and is that already saturated and so many failures there what's your feeling on that that's so it's b2c which is tough um, you have to have a massive, if you're, if you are just one person building this and you're not going to have a team, you're not going to have funding, you need to have a massive traffic stream, which means you need to be mobile because the iOS app store and the Android app store yeah. are really the only ways you're going to get enough people fast enough to actually make some money from it. I yeah. think if you try to build a fitness SaaS app as a bootstrapper, I think you're going to get stomped unless you mm -hmm. have a unique niche, a vertical that you can get a crap ton of people to because how much right. do you think you you know my wife is going to pay for a SaaS app right. as a consumer right. she's not cheap she's not yeah. a cheap person right. but right. she just is used to not paying yeah. for things because yeah. everything's free right, right. right. Facebook right. and Twitter it's all right. ad generated yeah. and you yeah. can't you need volume to do that so yeah. Yeah. I don't want to go off on a rant but yeah no, that's my no, deal right? so that's why B2C is tough okay. and in mobile it, it actually can work I have some Questions about whether it's going to work long term, but that's a whole other discussion. Okay, so right? let's okay. Well, let's go to B two B. What what are some key niches there that we should be looking at as SaaS developers to solve some problems? Any suggestions? Well, yeah, um, you know, we just recorded a podcast episode. I'm trying to live today, but it's all about looking at the factors uh, that your idea has, like how how large is the market, how are you going to reach that market, that kind of stuff. It's kind of some basic stuff, yeah. but. Um, what I would say is throwing out a list of niches, like saying, well, you should think right. about targeting karate studios okay. and yoga studios. Right, right, and this, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you know, you can do that. But the bottom line is none of that really matters unless you have an in with that niche. You're either a member of that niche or you have someone who right. you know right. who's going to stick with you and be customer zero. Right. No, so very when, I was cool. building, when I was building Drip, Hittail is customer zero. Okay. I happen to mm -hmm. own an app that needs Hittail. Or, oh, sorry, true. that needs Drip, and that's great. Right, right. 
Or if my brother had owned Hittail, that'd right. be okay because my brother's going to help me out. But if I'm literally just cold calling people yeah. and then trying to find realtors to try this app out, and right, then right, it's, right. it's going to be hard. Not impossible, yeah. right. really exponentially harder than okay. if you are your customer. Gotcha. You know? so, so we want to basically focus on maybe the problems that we're having or people that we know that have businesses and that we know intimately that we can probably get in on this. That's where I lean, yeah. Okay, so and and Dan, uh, Dane Cook, rather from the foundation, he talks about how his uncle was in real estate and why his first few SaaS apps were real estate oriented types apps because, you know, he had obviously his uncle's right there and he can talk to him all day mm -hmm. long trying to figure out what his pain points are. Mm -hmm. Yep. Well, okay, that's cool. Uh, I well, I'm gonna try to get him on. I'd love to have him talk and and tell us his uh, give us some secret sauce. Um, have you uh, have you thought about uh, doing this whole uh, his his mechanisms of calling? Have you ever done that with the target market? Trying to do you know trying to ask him these questions? Have you explored like cold those? calling and that stuff? Yeah. Yeah. Nope. A couple no a couple reasons. Number one is I don't need to go into a new market because I've, if you already have an audience, you should you should ask them what they want. Mm -hmm. So when I've needed to, yeah. I have either done just a survey. I mean, I have fifty five hundred people on an email list. I have yeah. five thousand people listening to a podcast I am on every week. Like I don't. Okay. I have the luxury. I, you know, I've put in the time. Yeah, it's eight yeah. years, but You've I have the luxury it. of not having to do that. Right. Yeah. I don't have to cold call. Number right. two, I hate cold calling. <laughs> I hate the phone. Right. I hate talking on the phone. Right. So yep. I just, even if I, if I was, I would still probably try to do it via email, even though it's kind of a cop out. Gotcha, gotcha, with, gotcha. with Drip, I emailed seventeen people. That was my customer development. Okay. Mm -hmm. And um, they, I, but I happened to know them. Right. They were right. founders. And then as we got into it, as I've started to get some people on onto my apps. Uh, uh, on to drip. I'm sorry. I ha we have done face-to-face -face Skype things as they're getting started and trying to figure out what they're building. So okay. I've done what he's saying, but it hasn't been cold. It's been with people that I know. Gotcha, gotcha. Well, I I have to tell you, uh, Rob, it's been awesome, incredible, actually, having you on. I, I say that quite a bit uh, usually at the end, but I truly mean it, Jeff. I don't know about you, man, but this has been like the best hour and 20 minutes I've had a, in a while. I, I appreciate yeah, that. Man. Absolutely. I mean, you know, this is right up our alley. We all aspire yeah. to uh, do what you've done, yeah. uh, you know, and have a, a, a page full of uh, web properties <laughs> yeah, that, are, cool. that are making money. So yes. awesome. we really do appreciate you coming on the show and sharing absolutely. your secrets with us. Yeah, yeah. yeah thanks for coming. Or, I'm sorry, thanks any, for having uh, me on. Yeah, do you have any uh, parting advice for any of the uh, you know struggling entrepreneurs that are looking at this and want to do what you've done? Absolutely. Um, I started doing this in 1999. It took me 14 years. I had dozens of failures. I'm not saying everyone will, but if I hadn't had that lame, uh, uh, completely cliche perseverance, that's what I'm going to say. It was yeah. for me the only reason I succeeded is because I kept getting back up on the horse. So yeah. Yeah. if you're out there and you're feeling discouraged, like you got to get back up there. You need to learn. You need to educate. You got to get better each time, mm -hmm. but you have to get back on the horse. What does what does that right. take to get back on the horse? Does it take just just like completely ignoring what happened in the past? Just like nope. uh, taking no, a week what, off, going off. I've done this. Oh. I have I have perseverance is a science with me because I do right. it so damn much because right. I've had so Let's many failures. Oh, I love this. You have Let's to do you have to do a couple things. My wife's a psychologist too, so okay. I've thought about this. I mean, you have to do a couple things. One, you typically need to take a break when when shit goes down and it yeah. fails, and you mm. you've spent six months or a year yeah. and yeah. thousands yeah. of dollars. Right. You have to just step away and do not do it anymore, and you can't. Mm. You'll burn out. So you got to take a couple months off and okay. you still work in your day gig. Chill, watch Mad Men, like right. be a normal person for a while right. and not one of us, right? right. Okay. Not the person doing it. So that's the first thing to take a break. Second thing is um, you have to then, after that distance, you need to do a post mortem and you need to look back and say, oh. why did that fail? Where did I misstep? What am I going to do differently? That's great. I like with that. every one of mine. And if you can get another person involved, like a colleague or something, yeah. um, uh, that helps a lot too. So And it also gives you some value, right? Like it don't feel like complete failure because I've learned all this right. stuff. That's right. It's always valuable. Third right. thing I say is get in a mastermind group. Get two other people who are in the same boat or ahead of you. In, in exactly where you are or slightly ahead is really where you want. Okay. Um, that has been invaluable for me. I've only been doing that for about two and a half years, but it okay. made a big So in big internet marketing wow. circles, masterminds are quite big. I, I'm not part of one. How did you find your mastermind? Um, I'm in two different ones. The There's one here locally. Uh, in my local town and I just met a couple guys who I liked. I really liked them personally at okay. a startup competition. Okay. And I basically said, let's go to lunch. 
And then I said, hey, do you guys want to meet again? I didn't make it formal, right? You guys want to meet again in two weeks? Right. And then I said, let's talk about our, our ideas. You know, right. let's talk about, and then I slurred, hey, here's a little agenda we could, like I totally okay. slipped it oh, out. Oh, that's nice. And pretty soon we were meeting every two weeks. <laughs> that's the one awesome. On Skype, the one on Skype was much more um, intentional and it was with two founders who I know and knew that they okay. already knew what masterminds were. So. Uh, really briefly, uh, you're in Fresno, am I right? That's am correct. I right? Yeah. So what's yeah. that like out there in Fresno? What's Ooh. the startup scene out there? <laughs> Out there is is a good way to put it. I grew up in the Bay Area, and okay. I've lived in L.A. and Boston, and and now Fresno. It there's a small startup scene there. Yeah, there there's not a lot. I'll put it that way. Um, <laughs> there are folks. There are several hundred developers here. Oh, really? In town, there's software companies. Wow. Yeah, I'd say okay. there's maybe 500 software developers in town. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Great. yeah, but there is there's this awesome competition called 59 Days of Code. It happens mm. once a oh. year. Started here, and they get about 35 startup entrants a oh, okay. year. And okay. I'm involved with that in one way or another, whether as a judge, I'm on the board, or a competitor. It's just really that's that's where everything goes down. So, okay. Um, it's, Can you tell us what the format on. of the competition is? Yeah, it's there's you have 59 days to build an app, mm -hmm. and so uh, and then on the 59th day, everybody gets together and you have um, you do presentations to some judges, and then the mm -hmm. judges pick basically the top three in a couple different categories, and then you the top three go up on stage and do like a PowerPoint presentation oh, okay. of the business specific. So everyone doesn't pitch cool. to, to everybody. Yeah. Okay, I like and then there's, there's, yeah. Cause otherwise that gets old. Yeah. But, and there's a lot of pride I mean, a lot of cash, 10 grand per category in cash. Bad. And then cool. a lot of, of, you know, product and stuff. So cool. We love hackathons and love to study the different events that are going on. I sure. have one final question for you, Rob. Uh, what's your feeling about angel list? What's your sense of that mm -hmm. whole? I think it's, um, I like AngelList, and I think that it's a, a good way. I think before AngelList, it was a catastrophe to try to raise angel funding or yeah. to try to find companies to raise angel funding. So yes. I'm, I'm a fan. I don't, I don't feel like they've – I haven't seen many negatives. I don't know if you guys feel otherwise. But I also think that as this crowdfunding stuff comes through with the, jo you know, the Jobs Act, once yeah. the SEC figures themselves out, right. that AngelList mm -hmm. is going to be epic, If assuming they integrate that, where you can do a one-click. I'd love to – I see startups all the time. I'm like, I, I totally invest a thousand bucks in this, yeah, but, yeah. but you can't right now, right? Because okay. mm -hmm. you're either not accredited or you just can't even do a thousand dollar investment. Right. But right. I think that's going to be really cool. So that'll wow. be a big breakthrough. That's yeah. great. Yeah. If people want to get a hold of you, and what's a good general email or whatever you feel comfortable with? Yes. Um, so the best is to go to softwarebyrob.com. Okay. And if you go to my about page, I keep, I change emails sometimes. So it's at the bottom of that okay. where it's, Right now, it's my Rob at softwarebyrob.com, but okay. um, it's down cool. there. While you're there, I actually I have a you know aside from the podcast where I talk about exactly this stuff every week for 30 minutes, okay. um, startups for the rest of us. I have a, an email newsletter as well at on okay. the thing, and that's what I keep active on. Awesome. Is there anything you're looking for? Are you, any any like workers for jobs or anything like that? You want to, anything our visitors should know about? I so I am actually looking for. Um, a, a really good Ruby developer contractor, okay. Okay. and I'm also looking for a um, a good. I'm trying to think how to kind of a someone who wants to be uh, like an intern, but who wants to get paid. Intern okay. sounds like you're young, but it's like someone who wants to. I'm going to kind of mentor them and train them up, and I want them to be have some front end stuff, HTML, CSS, JS, uh, jQuery, that kind of stuff. Okay. But uh, yeah, someone to come on. So. Wow, that's cool. great. Great. So you're looking for uh, somebody that's kind of a junior front end person that you can pay. And... That's right. Okay. Yep. That's gonna, but that's gonna do a lot of market. That wants to learn marketing and wants to learn SaaS apps and wow. learn the innards and and I want to teach him the metrics and I mean oh I'm gonna God. invest in them as much as yeah. This, this is a, that would be cool. a dream job for the right person, man. Sure. So. Yeah, hopefully, hopefully someone listening can uh, jump over and send you an email. Yeah, absolutely. That'd be great. That'd be great. Well, th well, thanks again, Rob. It's been amazing having you on, man. We're going to definitely be reaching out to you in a few months, checking in on see how things are going. When is this Very European cool. uh, conference, by the way? It's in October. In October. Yeah, October 5th in Prague. Yep. Okay. Microconf wow. Europe. Microconf in Europe. Prague. Wow, that is going to be so great. That'd be cool. Fresno yeah. to Prague. Here we go. I know. <laughs> I haven't been to Prague in 10 years, so it'll be fun. That's so awesome, man. Great. This is really great, man. And I hope you the most success. It's been it's been really great having you on, man. Thanks, yeah, thanks for your time. We'll definitely check in with you guys on the uh, the launch of GitDrip and, and uh, cool. all of your future announcements. That'd be fun. Yeah. Thanks for having me on, guys. Good luck. Right. Great. Okay. See you online.